Good morning, everybody. Happy summer, happy election day to everybody. Um, I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, we are here to examine the Nicholas Scapetta Children's Center, and we'll consider intro 1358, aimed at creating transparency around the use of psychiatric medication for youth in foster care. Um, we have yet to be joined by other members of the committee, but I imagine that they will be here throughout the morning. Uh, the Scapetta Center opened in 2001 at First Avenue and 28th Street in Manhattan and is a temporary residence for children coming into foster care until a permanent placement can be found. The historic building was a vast improvement over its predecessor, a, quote, tiny dingy building where cots were placed in the waiting room near the Holland Tunnel. In 2013, the Children's Center was named to honor Nicholas Scapetta, the first commissioner of ACS, who was raised in foster care and is widely credited with drastically improving child welfare in New York City. At the time the Children's Center opened, at the time the Children's Center opened, some child welfare advocates expressed concern that it would become a shelter where children were kept for too long. Another Children's Center on Fifth Avenue and East 104th Street became a place where children languished for years in the 1970s and was closed in 1977 amid scandal and litigation. Mr. Scapetta, who remembered being locked in a closet in this old center, promised that there would be no repetition of the abuse that occurred previously, stating, quote, there's no reason that it couldn't become a national center for child welfare. Now, here we are, 18 years after the Children's Center opened, wondering if history is repeating itself. The Children's Center is currently under a cloud of scandal and litigation and has become, as advocates feared in 2001, a place where children languish for too long. We are hearing reports of missing children, assaults, thefts, overcrowding, and sedated children at Bellevue for misbehavior. One of the most egregious cases was brought to our attention earlier this year when it was uncovered that a family court judge had found, that the ACS, found the ACS commissioner to be in contempt of court for failing to meet the most basic needs of a teenager named Kenneth. He was struck by a car in 2014, leaving him with traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injuries, and was prescribed a variety of weekly therapies that were not provided while he, relied in, while he resided in the children's center. Judge Emily Olshansky's contempt order documents a litany of failures by ACS, including not replacing a broken wheelchair for more than a year, never applying for a home health aid to assist Kenneth with his daily activities, not getting him an updated medical exam, and failing to provide him with the required occupational speech or physical therapy. He was made to suffer other indignities, such as being unable to access the bathroom during visits with his family, leaving him sitting in his own urine. I find it distressing that a teenager with an attorney and a judge on his side could still not obtain the basic necessities required by law, and I wonder how many children suffer in silence. Up until last month, ACS was seeking family court protect protective arrest warrants when children in ACS's care would leave without permission, having law enforcement return them in handcuffs despite having broken no laws. Fortunately, last month, the appellate division put an end to this traumatizing practice, finding no legal basis for such warrants. ACS has taken measures to remove older youth from the Children's Center in recent years, including the opening of a few youth reception centers to house 14 to 21-year-olds while they're awaiting placement and a, host, and a host home program which offered foster homes for older youth and 15 hours a week with a social worker. These programs are meant to place youth in smaller settings with more resources where their needs can be met. However, the host, host, host home program was discontinued in 2017. I look forward to learning from ACS and providers about the progress of youth, re, the youth reception centers and what caused the collapse of the host home program. ACS has also recently announced a number of reforms at the Children's Center, including a review of youth with special needs, leadership changes, additional security cameras, an increase in peace officers, and working closely with NYPD. ACS has announced that an independent expert will be making a thorough review and making recommendations for reforms. Mm -hmm. I look forward to hearing about the progress of all of these measures and any other efforts that ACS is taking to improve conditions at the Children's Center and relocate children who are better served through other programs. 
I also want to discuss security measures that are being taken at the Children's Center to ensure the right balance of safety and child well-being are being met. We do not want the Children's Center to feel like a detention facility. We will also today be considering Intro 1358, a bill that I'm sponsoring to shed some light on the use of psychotropic medication by children in ACS's care. Studies have found significantly higher rates of psychiatric medication use for children in foster care than the general population. ACS should be collecting and monitoring data on whether medications prescribed to youth in foster care were approved by the FDA for, for, chil for child's diagnosis and tracking data on the number of clinicians who have prescribed medication to each young person. ACS will be required to submit a report identifying problematic prescribing trends within foster care agencies, such as the concurrent use of multiple medications, prescriptions for children under five, prescriptions to more than one, for more than one medication for the same class, sorry, prescriptions to more than one medication from the same class of medications, and prescriptions without any therapeutic services. I would like to thank council staff for their work to prepare for today's hearing, Council Minta Kilowan, policy analysts Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, and finance analyst Daniel Krupp. I'd also like to thank my legislative director, Elizabeth Adams, and chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher. Um, now I'll turn it over to um, the commissioner and, and deputy commissioners for their testimony, but uh, first I'll ask Council of the Committee to swear you in. Mm -hmm. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today before this committee in your testimony and to answer honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Levin. Um, I am David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Um, with me today are to my right, Julie Farber, who is our Deputy Commissioner of Family Permanency Services. To my immediate left, Wynette Saunders, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Administration. And my far left, Dr. Suchet Rao, who is our Medical Director for Psychiatry and Behavioral Health. As Commissioner, I have no greater responsibility than to make sure that the children who are entrusted into ACS's care are safe and well cared for in an environment that reduces the negative impact of trauma, allowing them to begin to heal. Over the past few months, building on the foundation put in place over many years, we've made significant progress in strengthening the work we do at the Children's Center and to more expeditiously find placements for children and youth. While there's still more work to be done and some of our initiatives take time to implement, we're proud of the progress that we've made. And we appreciate the opportunity to discuss ACS's ongoing quality improvement and enhancements at the Nicholas Scapetta Children's Center with you today. Our work on behalf of the children who come to the Children's Center focuses on three key goals. First, to provide a safe, trauma-informed, welcoming environment for the children and youth. Second, to provide all of the services and supports that children and youth need while they're at the Children's Center, including health, mental health, education, programming, and other supports for children and youth experiencing trauma. And third, to find a safe and supportive foster care placement setting that meets the child's needs until he or she can return home or another permanency arrangement is finalized. The Children's Center serves as the entry point for many of the children and youth who come into New York City's foster care system. This includes children and youth who have been abused or neglected, youth who are placed on persons in need of supervision petitions when parents are struggling with their youth behavior, youth leaving the juvenile justice system who do not have an identified resource to care for them, and children and youth whose parents voluntarily place them in foster care because they are struggling to care for their children. As you know, ACS provides prevention services and supports so that the overwhelming majority of children we come into contact with can remain safely at home with their families. When children and youth come into foster care, ACS makes every effort to identify a safe kinship placement with family or close friends known to that child. When a kinship placement cannot be immediately found, ACS identifies a foster home or other appropriate foster care setting based on the child's needs. The Children's Center is a 24-7 setting that provides medical clearances for children and is a temporary placement for children when there is no appropriate foster care setting immediately available. Nearly half of the children are at the Children's Center for one day or less. More than two-thirds leave the Children's Center within four days. And the center serves New York City's most vulnerable children and youth 
a total of 2,773 children, unique children last year, age range from newborn to 21. From the first day that a child enters foster care in New York City, ensuring their safety, permanency, and well-being is crucial. In recent months, ACS has undertaken a comprehensive, deep analysis of the Children's Center, including a close examination of how we are meeting the needs of children as well as programmatic and operational requirements. In March of this year, I ordered a number of immediate steps that included these. An intensive case review of every child with special needs by our chief medical officer, which ensured that these children and youth were safe and healthy and that their needs were being met. Security enhancements to maintain the safe environment for youth and staff that's necessary to create a therapeutic milieu and enhance collaboration with the NYPD on both youth enrichment opportunities in the Children's Center and safety in the surrounding community. Expanded high-level leadership support at the Children's Center, including leveraging Deputy Commissioner Wynette Saunders' expertise in youth programming, safety, and security protocols. In addition to these immediate actions, we've continued to make enhancements in the past three months, which I'll detail more thoroughly in my testimony. But these include onboarding a new assistant commissioner to the Children's Center, David Bauer, who brings more than 20 years of clinical experience and expertise working with children in residential care, developing a new staffing plan for the hiring of 95 additional staff for the Children's Center across multiple program and operational functions, significantly expanding programming for the children and youth at the Children's Center, enhancing safety for youth and staff by putting in place additional peace officers and renovating the entry screening area to allow for easier identification and removal of potentially dangerous contraband. Creating and implementing a plan for short-term and long-term renovations to the facility, which will move non-essential functions out of the building and expand the space available for youth programming. And finally, expanding the number and range of placement options available throughout our foster care system for high-needs youth and enhancing case planning and family finding services on site, all with the goal of expediting placement of young people from the Children's Center to more appropriate settings. I'll now provide you with more information about the work that we have done to add new resources and enhancements in these core areas. Staffing and training, therapeutic milieu and clinical services, education, programming, safety, facilities enhancements, and initiatives to decrease the census and length of stay at the Children's Center. We know the children who have experienced abuse and neglect removal and other separations from their families are experiencing some of their moments of greatest trauma. At the Children's Center, it's our job to minimize trauma and help children begin the healing process. Continuing to enhance the therapeutic milieu at the Children's Center is therefore a top priority. In April, we added an assistant commissioner to the Children's Center, David Bauer, who is implementing new therapeutic models to best meet the needs of children and youth. We also partner closely with the Bellevue Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry to meet children's clinical and mental health needs. An on-site team that includes professionals in psychiatry, psychology, and social work provide assessments, counseling, and crisis intervention, as well as training and consultation for our Children's Center staff. We're implementing more community meetings with youth as a way to consistently check in, allow youth to express ideas and concerns, and problem solve around challenges. While our goal is for youth to feel safe and empowered to express themselves, we've also instituted a feedback, a feedback suggestion box where youth can anonymously share any concerns or suggestions that they may have. We're also working with Save Our Streets, otherwise known as SOS, to bring credible, credible messengers and restorative justice practices to the Children's Center and to implement a youth council, all with the goal of reducing incidents on and off site and engaging youth in positive activities and behaviors. These practices are crucial to incorporate youth voice into our practices and to build community with the young people who are with us, even if only for a short time. The Children's Center provides a wide range of educational, recreational, and social emotional programs that are delivered both on site and off site in partnership with community organizations, NYPD, the Department of Education, and many, many other partners. 
The goals of our programming are to reduce the impact of trauma, to provide enrichment and recreation, to meet children's social and emotional needs, to provide life skills and social skills, and to enhance safety by reducing idle time. We have long-standing trauma reduction programs with Culture for One, the Pajama Program, and many others. And many new programs have been added during the past few months, including collaboration with the Lower East Side Girls Club and the National Arts Club. We hold celebrations for holidays and special occasions, including our second annual LGBTQ Pride event and Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rican Heritage Month celebrations, both of which held this month. Programming, of course, is key to helping reduce trauma and provide connections and enrichment. And we greatly appreciate the assistance of the community and the local elected officials in our program development efforts. This summer, youth at the Children's Center are participating in DYCD's Summer Youth Employment Program. They'll be participating in an NBA basketball camp at Chelsea Piers. They'll be attending summer school, participating in creative artworks, spending time at the Astor Levy Swimming Pool and Gym, and the Tony Dapolito Rec Recreation Center. Many of our providers will continue programming over the summer, including Planned Parenthood, Culture for One, New York Roadrunners, the Good Dog Foundation, and Beautiful Me. And we'll continue our Friday movie night, our Saturday bingo night, our Sunday karaoke dance night, and also organize basketball tournaments and ping pong tournaments. We have a number of trips already organized, including FDR State Park, Splish Splash Water Park, Great Adventure, Playland Park, Coney Island, and the Bronx Zoo. Beyond this, we're leveraging an additional million dollars in funding to expand programming at the Children's Center even further in the coming year. And I want to thank our partners at OMB and the Mayor's Office for working with us to achieve this important priority. We're looking forward to expanding on-site and off-site programming to engage children and youth while they're at the Children's Center. I am deeply grateful to the staff who dedicate each day to caring for children at the Children's Center. The team at the Children's Center includes childcare staff, social workers, a pediatrician, and a team of nurses, staff that design and implement programming for children and youth, placement specialists, and an on-site team of mental health professionals from Bellevue Hospital. Their jobs are incredibly challenging and rewarding, and I wanted to be sure to use this opportunity to thank them for all that they do. We are focused on building our workforce of highly trained, dedicated individuals who meet children at their most vulnerable moments. In addition to Assistant Commissioner Bauer, we've added a new Deputy Director for Programming to join the dedicated team of staff who are working to continually expand and target programming opportunities to meet the needs of children and youth. We regularly assess the staffing needs at the Children's Center to maintain the correct staffing ratios as the census fluctuates and to minimize the use of temporary staff. As a result, and given the high priority of the Children's Center and the children we serve there, we work with our partners at OMB and the Mayor's Office who have authorized the hiring of an additional 95 staff for the Children's Center over the coming months. These will include 49 positions in the Child Care Department, 12 social workers, 9 positions in the Office of Placement, 3 in our Programming and Wellness Department, and 22 positions in the Intake Department, including engagement specialists and visiting specialists. We are also working hard to enhance training and professional development for the Children's Center workforce to equip staff with the tools they need to keep children safe and to minimize trauma. As such, we're now adding two dedicated positions within the ACS Workforce Institute to exclusively focus on providing training and professional development for Children's Center staff. In addition to training on safe crisis management, a trauma-informed de-escalation and crisis response protocol, Children's Center staff participated in 19 different training sessions from January through May on other topics. These included safe sleep, suicide prevention, working with children with autism, trauma and its effect on brain development, and providing culturally competent services for LGBTQ youth. We also work with partners, including Safe Horizon, Bellevue, and others, to offer training for staff on important topics like human trafficking prevention and engagement with youth exposed to trauma. Tending to the medical needs of children who come to the Children's Center is also a critical component of our work. We have on-site or on-call pediatric physicians, 
or nurse practitioner in nursing coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In addition to medical care, children and youth at the Children's Center are evaluated and provided with dental care and vision care. The medical director and the nursing staff are able to identify medical needs of the children by conducting a physical examination and reviewing information from the caseworker, from previous medical records, and from the school as these become available. A comprehensive care plan is then developed and medical needs are addressed throughout the child's stay at the Children's Center. The medical director has daily check-ins with nursing staff, communicates daily with the child and family specialists regarding the appropriate level of care, and attends weekly meetings with the Office of Placement Administration to provide advice on the placement of children and youth with complex medical needs. In addition, the medical director updates ACS's chief medical officer on any child or youth at the Children's Center with complex or acute needs. When children have experienced trauma and disruption, school is a critical thread of continuity, and that's why we're intensely focused on making sure that children at the Children's Center are able to attend their home schools when it's in their best interest, and that youth who have been disconnected from school prior to coming to ACS are re-engaged and supported to continue their education. For younger children and those with special needs, ACS Transportation Services accompanies the children to and from school every day. We've implemented a shuttle service to the 14th Street subway hub so that older children can more easily get to their needed destination. And our local neighborhood coordination officers have been incredible partners in this effort by meeting with older youth on site and providing mentorship about the importance of education. To better serve our young people who require alternative education pathways, we've established an on-site high school equivalency program with our partners at the New York City Department of Education, where older youth can meet with a guidance counselor, take the high school equivalency tests, and attend classes to get their education back on track. ACS is committed to a safe environment for every child who comes to the Children's Center and every staff member who works there. It is critical the children and youth who come to the Children's Center at what is often one of the most traumatized moments in their lives feel safe in our care. Safety is an essential component to creating a therapeutic milieu to begin to address trauma so children and youth can begin to heal and to thrive. So to do this, we have increased the number of peace officers at the Children's Center which has enabled them to spend more time on the floors where children and youth reside, interacting with youth and staff and making them feel safer. Our peace officers, as well as all other Children's Center staff, have been trained in safe crisis management. ACS has also renovated the entry screening room so that it has more space and can enable staff to better find and confiscate any potentially dangerous contraband. We completed construction to expand the screening room last month and it's fully operational. We have an invaluable partnership with the local 13th precinct which involves both youth enrichment activities and security support in the external environment. And I cannot thank our NYPD colleagues enough for their dedication to our efforts to help ACS remain a good neighbor in the community. Given our changing needs at the Children's Center, ACS has been making some short-term facility enhancements as well as developing a longer-term renovation plan. We recently renovated the security screening room and installed additional security cameras. This summer, New recreational furniture, new beds and dressers, and Wi-Fi will be in place. And we're moving some unrelated administrative operations out of the building, which will allow us to expand the space available for programming for children. We're also working with DDC on a longer term capital plan, which will include creating an additional intake space, relocating the nursery to the first floor, renovating the second floor, and turning the current auditorium into a gymnatorium. Our immediate and longer term efforts to enhance services, supports, and safety for everyone at the Children's Center are critically important, but of equal importance and focus, we've been identifying additional ways to reduce, reduce the length of stay for children at the Children's Center and to establish more options within our care continuum to serve older youth. While nearly half of all the children who come to the center are there for less than 24 hours and two thirds leave within four days, there's a relatively small number of high need children and young people for whom placement is more complex and can take longer. We're in the process of recalibrating our system 
to best serve the full range of young people who reside at the Children's Center and to expedite the process of identifying the most appropriate placements for all of them. We've already taken key steps in this area and more are on the way, including these. We've added case planners at the Children's Center to focus on finding kin or other foster care placements. We've enhanced proactive case planning and home finding for youth in detention who are likely to be discharged soon and who do not have a family resource. We've instituted a family finder pilot with three of our foster care providers who will help find kin resources and provide prevention services for long stayers at both the Children's Center and the Youth Reception Centers. We created 144 new therapeutic family foster care slots. Therapeutic family foster care is a family-based foster care setting where the child receives specialized services for youth with moderate to severe behavioral or emotional issues while living with a specially trained foster parent. We've added residential care capacity, including eight new beds already in use with our provider Abbott House and 11 new beds coming online soon through our provider Cardinal McCloskey. And we're collaborating with DOHMH on interventions for high needs youth 18 years or older who have serious mental health issues by referring those youth to the DOHMH intensive mobile treatment teams and the forensic assertive community treatment programs. In addition to these programs already underway, we're continuing to explore and identify additional placement options. We've recently identified a new residential care site within our portfolio that is planned to open in the coming months to serve eight high needs youth. We're working very closely with our state partners, the Office of Mental Health and the Office of Children and Family Services and New York City DOHMH to pursue the development of a new program tailored to youth who need higher levels of care. We're also continuing to work and advocate with the State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities to enable our youth who reach age 21 to be placed into the OPWDD system if their long-term care needs can best be met in that system. Now, building our relationship with our neighbors, with tenant associations, community-based organizations, and elected officials in the Children's Center Manhattan community has helped us develop important collaborations with community members and the many programs and services nearby. In the fall of 2018, we created a community advisory board because we wanted to engage all of our stakeholders in supporting the critical work at the Children's Center. I want to be sure to use the opportunity here to thank the members of our Children's Center advisory board, which includes elected officials, the local community board, Bellevue, NYPD, program partners, neighbors, tenant associations, and other leaders from our neighborhood. These members have been committed to helping us problem solve issues in the community, to provide ACS with connections to local assets, including programming in the nearby parks, at the Lower East Side Girls Club, the National Arts Club, and more. And they've been ambassadors to help demystify our work at the Children's Center and to carry important messages, for example, foster care recruitment to the community. And I want to especially thank Council Member Powers and Council Member Rivera and your incredible staffs for your work with us on the advisory board. Let me now move on to uh, the proposed legislation. We very much appreciate the Council's interest in data regarding the prescribing of psychiatric medication to children in foster care. We are well aware of the national data and trends that show high rates of psychiatric medications being prescribed for children in foster care. During my service in the Federal Administration for Children and Families in the Obama administration, I became familiar with this disturbing national pattern and I came to ACS determined to address it. Because of our deep concern with these problematic prescribing trends, we drafted a new policy and have issued guidelines while the policy goes through the finalization process that aim to make New York City a leader in this area. The policy was released for public comment some time ago and is now with OCFS for final approval. This new policy and the interim guidelines seek to ensure that psychiatric medication is used sparingly and judiciously with children and youth in foster care with a well-established medical need. To do this, the policy seeks to ensure that psychiatrists document a clear indication for use of medication as an element of a comprehensive treatment plan based on a recent psychiatric examination and after having first considered and implemented other treatment options including trauma-informed therapeutic services. While medica when medication is recommended, 
No more than one medication should be prescribed at a time except in extreme circumstances. The child should be monitored regularly and medication should be adjusted so that the minimum effective dose is used at all times. Clinically speaking, there are good reasons a medication may be necessary at a certain point in time, but we want to ensure that prescribers are routinely checking whether the minimal effective dose is being used or if the medication is required at all. Efforts should be made to taper off or discontinue medication after a certain period so that youth receive the lowest effective dose. Our foster care providers are also required to get parental consent whenever possible, and ACS has a stringent oversight and approval process for any parental overrides in instances where necessary for children's well-being and where we are legally authorized to do so. When youth are over 18, married, or parenting, the youth is able to make the decision to consent on his or her own. And our psychiatrists are regularly, they regularly provide consultations to foster care agencies and to parents regarding psychiatric medications, their impact, and alternatives. Our new policy aims to strengthen parental engagement in the decisions around the use of these medications. The new policy will require more detailed written consent for parents, strict time limits on the provision of these medications before the need for a new consent and review, and additional steps to prevent the prescription of multiple psychiatric medications. We are eager to implement this policy as soon as it is approved by our state oversight agency, OCFS. Like the council, ACS believes that having data about the systemic use of psychiatric medications would be valuable. Currently, in addition to our oversight of individual cases, ACS has a medical audit unit which conducts annual reviews of the health and mental health care that children in foster care receive. But while the prescription of these medications needs to be individualized, data about aggregate use and trends would provide us with insight into our system as a whole. Currently, ACS does not have access to the data that the council is requesting, but we are advocating for access to aggregated data about the use of psychiatric medications in our foster care system. These data are currently collected in the Medicaid data system overseen by the State Department of Health. These data, like all health data, are protected by strong privacy laws and regulations. But given our responsibilities, ACS believes it is critical for us to have this information to ensure that medications are being appropriately administered so that we have requested access to the information from our state partners, OCFS, OMH, and DOH. One of the recommendations of the Foster Care Task Force was to advocate to the state to provide ACS with access to the Psychiatric Services and Clinical Knowledge Enhancement System, known as Psyches, which is a web-based portfolio of tools that uses data from the New York State Medicaid Claims Database to generate data about diagnoses and treatment, including psychiatric medications prescribed. We've been in conversations with OMH and OCFS about getting access to the information in this system, and we are optimistic that this will be resolved. Once we gain access to Psyches, we believe that we would have much of the information the City Council is looking for in this bill, and we'd welcome the opportunity to talk more at that time about what data we can publicly report and provide to the Council. In addition, children in foster care are due to transition into Medicaid-managed care in October of this year. As part of our conversations with the state about this transition, we've also been advocating to get access to more aggregate level data regarding the health and mental health of children in foster care. It's our understanding that after the transition to managed care, there should be additional linkages to medical data in the system of record connections that we use uh, at the request and, and the mandate of OCFS. And so we are continuing to advocate for access through this route as well. So to conclude, let me thank you for the opportunity to discuss our work at the Children's Center, the ways in which we are enhancing the services that we provide when children first come into foster care, and our efforts to ensure psychiatric medications are prescribed as judiciously as possible for children in foster care. I thank the Council for your leadership and steadfast support 
and look forward to our continued partnership, and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Keith Powers for, for questions. Uh, he's uh, somewhat time limited here, so yeah, appreciate it. Um, then we'll get, we'll get to our Thank you, and I want to be here as the centers in my district and, as you know, just across the street from Councilmember Rivera's district. So we've heard some of the, you know, as events have happened in the community in the last couple of years, um, have both heard from constituents related to some of the high-profile incidents and um, appreciate the forming of the Community Advisory Board and other ways to be responsive to the community and to the elected officials. Just to take a step back, the um, and I do have to run to a hearing, so thank you for, uh, for the time. Um, can you just tell me how, how many children today are living or in the Children's Center? Is it today? Is that coming up? 75. 75. Right. You to the microphone. 75 was the census this morning. 75 this morning. And is that at capacity or what is total capacity? It is uh, below capacity. Our, our um, license capacity from the state is 101. Um, it is consistent with pretty much what the average census has been. Over the past year, the average census has been about 77, so it is consistent since with that. The, since when has it been 77? Over the past year, the, the year. average census has and, been And has it gone up over the last few years? I, I uh, noted uh, in, our, in our report it had the census around 30 in, I think, 2014. Is that correct? Yes. Over the past several years, the average census has gone up. Okay. And is the, what's the age range of, of uh, children living at the chil Children's Center? Uh, we serve children from newborns up to age 21. Up uh, to 20, okay. And, um, and what's the average length of a child's stay currently at the Children's Center? Well, uh, as I said, about half of the children who come into the center leave within a day. About two-thirds leave within four days. Um, and then there are a small number, mostly older youth, who stay for longer periods of time because uh, it's a more complex process to find an appropriate placement for them. Okay. Is there a, has that average gone up in the last few years? No, it's stayed consistent. So, well, we've had an increase uh, in the number in, in, in the number of some uh, older teens who have been staying longer, but the vast majority, as the commissioner said, still leave within three or four days. Okay, but the, but the question was, has that gone up? So the answer is no, the average stay? Or is it for just for older kids that average stay has gone up? Just for older kids, there's a, a group of kids who have been staying longer, but in general, um, uh, the vast majority of kids are leaving within one, two, or three days. Okay, and and why? Do, what do you attribute to the increase in census? And and well, let's start there. What do, what is what does the city attribute to, or the or the agency attribute to the increase in the daily census? So. Um, couple of things. I mean, certainly um, after high profile incident in 2016, there was a, an uptick initially, um, as, as happens when there's an increase in, in public reporting. Um, and then, uh, as we alluded, what we um, have seen at the Children's Center is a group of young people um, with very high needs um, who uh, it is um, challenging to find the right set of placements in the foster care system for these young people as we've seen positive decreases um, in the juvenile justice system. Um, there is a group of kids for whom we are really working to find the right set of services um, and placements for those young people. The, the other thing I might add to that is that as you know, we've talked about this in previous hearings, um, the number of young people in foster care in New York City has continued to decline. It's lower, is about 8,300 now, lower than it has been, um, uh, lower than it's been in, in decades, really. Um, but the proportion of young people coming into foster care who have more complex needs has proportionally increased as the overall population has gone yeah, why, down. Why, but what do you attribute to that? Um, I, well, I, I, I would say, and again, I, I can't uh, connect these definitively, but as we've testified in previous hearings, um, I think the reduction in the foster care census overall has to do primarily with our investment in preventive services so that we're able to serve more families, keep more families together, keep more children at home, even in situations where uh, we've identified some concerns um, than we used to be able to do, and so fewer of those children now come into foster care. Got it. And the, and the 100, what, what, is, what did you say is the capacity, 101? Is that the number? Yes. Okay. 101 is the capacity. Does that mean that you feel comfortable with 101 
children in your class in, in the children's center at any given time, and that seems to be that could be the maximum that the state allows, but not necessarily what would be <clears throat> comfortable or be able to for, for the agency to be able to serve them appropriately. What is the number by which you feel that you are maxed out in terms of population, in terms of space, ability to serve? Uh, and give them and staffing ratios and things like that. Well, our goal is to keep the population as low as possible. Our goal is to place. Our goal initially is if if a child comes into foster care through any of the routes I mentioned, and it's, it's, it could be through an abuse and neglect investigation, could be through a pins petition, could be through a voluntary placement by a family, um, or it could be a child leaving the juvenile justice system without a family resource to take uh, responsibility for them. However, they come in. Our goal is to find them a foster care placement uh, immediately, or, or ideal, a kinship placement immediately. Um, the, foster, the Children's Center is only there in situations where we can't immediately find a kinship or a foster care placement. So our goal is to keep it as low as possible, and our goal is also when children come to the Children's Center uh, to continue to identify uh, another resource, kinship resource, foster care placement, or residential placement as quickly as possible. So our goal is to keep the population at the Children's Center as low as we possibly can. Yeah, well, so is mine, but I, my question was actually, what do you feel is the comfortable number for how many? It's been impressed upon me that perhaps you're getting overcrowded uh, in that facility, and it's, 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 I think it's fair and appropriate to say there's a number by which the state would say this is how much you're licensed for versus what you feel is actually the amount of people, you know, the amount of children you can have in, your, in the custody there um, to be able to serve that, uh, that population appropriately. So I just want to, I'll just repeat the question, which is do you feel if you were at 101 today that every children would be served appropriately and you wouldn't feel overcrowded? Yes, we feel we can safely and appropriately serve a uh, capacity 101, which is, I think, the basis for the state setting that level for our licensure. What's the highest amount of children you've had in the Children's Center at any, on any day? Um, we, so what we do is, is when, we, we, when we see ourselves approaching that limit, which happens periodically because kids come and go all the time, um, we implement a number of more aggressive steps to reduce the population, and again, wherever we can, to divert children from coming to the Children's Center in the first place. Um, so, and, and Deputy Commissioner Farber can describe those, but basically it's working more intensively with our foster care agency partners to make sure that we are utilizing every other resource available in our system, to make sure that we're fully utilizing the resources within our youth reception centers, anything we can um, to move children out of the Children's Center quickly or to keep them from coming into the Children's why, Center. Why wouldn't that be the strategy every day then? It is, it is, it is, but as we approach because, we, as I said, we want to keep the population as low as possible. Um, if we uh, are approaching a, a higher, the, up to the limit, we would begin to uh, implement a number of more aggressive strategies um, as we need to do that to make sure that we don't go above that limit. Okay. And, um, I was just going to say, and, and fortunately, um, as I think Council Member Levin alluded, um, the Scopetta Center is a large and beautiful building, um, and it's spacious, um, and so we have the capacity um, to serve 101 children. We're also, as I think the commissioner mentioned in his testimony, there's already a lot of programming space at the Children's Center where we have um, many, many, many different programs um, on site. But literally just this week, um, we're actually moving some other functions out of the Children's Center to uh, increase the programming space there. You're moving administrative space, it's, is that correct? We're moving some administrative function that does not need to be at the Children's Center, right. um, and there'll be we'll be creating um, even more programming space for the young people, but it is a, it is a very large and spacious building. Got it, okay, thank, thank you. Um, the, I, I think there in the past have been some conversation around moving older children out of the Children's Center. Is that still happening? Is, what's, what are the plans to do that? So, um, as I think Councilmember Levin uh, mentioned, we did create over the last couple of years um, three new youth reception centers that uh, I think it's 30 beds um, that serve young people 14 to 21. Um, and those centers have been operating. And as the commissioner mentioned, um, we use those centers on a daily basis um, to try and reduce the numbers of teens at the children's center. And are you at capacity at those ones, or what, what, what would prevent you from doing a full switchover of the 14 to 18 year olds from the Children's Center to one of those three facilities? Those three are typically at capacity. Okay. okay. And how's it determined whether you go to one or you come to, to Manhattan? I, I, where are the other three sites? Um, one is in Brooklyn and 
Staten Island. Sorry, two are in Brooklyn. Two are in Brooklyn, one's in Staten Island. And how are you, how does it decide whether you go to Brooklyn or Staten Island or Manhattan? Yeah, so a couple of, a couple of different factors. Um, you know, we consider the best interests of the child first, first and foremost, um, and so geography. So if a you know, child is from Brooklyn, um, and, and nearby one of the Brooklyn YRC. So that's sort of our first and foremost concern. Um, and then um, obviously if there are no spaces at the YRC, then a child might come to the Children's Center. But our first choice would be to place teenagers at the YRCs and the YRC that's closest to their, you know, to their home and school. Is there, the, the, is there a reason there's not one in Queens or the Bronx? Well, there is one in the Bronx. There is a, uh, a reception center for young children, zero to 12 in the Bronx. Um, and this is where we were able to cite these four okay. programs. Okay, um, I'll, using a lot of my time up, so I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll ask a two cool more questions. One is, can you just talk about, this has come up, I think, at the cab, but certainly leading into it. It's the protocols for when a child leaves the children's center to go somewhere else. Obviously, you have activities that you bring them to in my district and throughout the city, and I think even outside of the city. Um, but also, um, I was just curious, what are, what are the what are the the protocols for somebody being able to leave? Is there a curfew? What ha what happens to that? Because that's been some questions that have come up in the community, I think yeah. the Community Advisory Board and others mm -hmm. about what those processes are. Absolutely, and we've discussed that at the Community Advisory Board. I mean, our first priority is the safety of children, um, you know, at the Children's Center, off-site from the Children's Center. Um, and so um, we work with young people. Uh, we have staff that are working very closely with young people to engage them, to understand uh, where they're planning on going if they're going off-site. I mean, one important thing that, that I know you understand is that this is a child welfare facility, so it is, it's not a jail, it's not a, a locked facility. Um, and we also follow reasonable, what's called reasonable and prudent parenting standards, and teenagers are allowed to you know, go out in the community. Um, of course, we work with um, young people to try and understand you know where they're going and what their plan is um, and uh, to ensure their safety um, in terms of leaving the children's center and is, is there a curfew and is is it a so I'm I know with some of the sh like other facilities there's like a curfew but yep. obviously you're not going to deny somebody if they need a place for the night but what what, what are the rules around curfew and hours well, there, there's a curfew. There is a curfew, and they, they differ depending on the age, whether you're 15 or whether you're 17, but it's somewhere around 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And if you come back after the curfew? Oh, no. You, we let you back in. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to end there. Yeah, I, I would actually, I've never, I, 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 I was telling to the chair that at some point would love to actually, I think maybe for both of us to combine, actually get a tour of the facility as well. I live 10 blocks from there or something, <laughs> so it's easy for me, but we'll, like, we'll invite the chair as well if, if you'd be amenable to that. And um, uh, I appreciate your work to help with the community understand um, uh, the challenges you have and then also understanding the, you know, the challenges the community have raised in terms of, I think as the census you know, is also growing, that um, there's been more incidents and uh, you know, I appreciate your work to help address those swiftly. Um, but uh, you know, of course we always still get questions about it and we'll, we'll always continue to, to, to um, engage the agency and administration on those challenges. But also with, you know, I think at some point uh, I'll bring the chair with me and would love to come by and take a tour, take a visit to it as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, I do want to, I know I mentioned in the testimony, but Councilmember Powers, I do want to thank you and your staff. Um, you have been very supportive and helpful to us. You have helped us to build relationships uh, with the community so we could address concerns and also bring services to the young people. And uh, I should probably also acknowledge Assemblymember Epstein, who of course has worked very closely with, that in, with you in that regard as well. So we're very appreciative of that. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, so uh, just, to con just to confirm on the record, so it's possible for us to, to take a tour? So I know it might be sensitive because there's... It uh, is. Obviously, yeah. you know, we are um, required both by law and, and by good practice to protect the privacy and the confidentiality of the kids. These are kids who, as I said in the testimony, of course, are in difficult moments in their lives, and yeah. we don't want to expose them to more trauma, so we really right. don't. Uh, make sort of the, the children's centers a whole publicly available, but we can work with you certainly uh, to arrange an opportunity for you to view some of the programmatic uh, areas within the children's center. So we'd be happy okay. to talk with you further about that. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to. Um, also, we've been joined by Council Members Lander and Reynoso as well. Um, 
I want to follow up a little bit on uh, Councilmember Power's questions, just to get a better sense of, of what the overall picture is at the Children's Center. So um, he asked about the census um, growing over, over time. Um, I think in 2013, uh, the average daily census was somewhere around 30, and that's grown to, to an, an average daily census of, of close to 80, and, and then as you said, 75 today. Um, that's obviously an enormous increase, over 200, you know, over 200 percent, and um, I know that there's recent incidents, uh, high-profile cases that have led to uh, an increase in calls to the SCR um, and investigations, um, and that has driven some of this, but there has to be more that has led to this significant um, increase. And I feel like if we are able to fully understand what has gone into that um, and what has driven that increase, um, we'll be better able to determine what the appropriate solutions would be um, if we really get a sense of what has driven that increase in census and what has driven that increase in length of stay um, and because it's, you know, the, the, the basics of the child welfare system have not changed since 2013. Um, so the, you know, the, 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 the foundations of it are, are, you know, things have, there, there have been incidents, um, but, but the, the basics haven't changed. And in fact, um, you know, the overall trends are going in positive directions, so. Well, let me, let me say a few things, and I'll let Deputy Commissioner Farber add. So I, you're right. This, it's very important for us to understand uh, what's behind the increase uh, in the population of the Children's Center, and we try very hard to do that. I, I would, I think, identify three things in particular, which I, two of which we've touched on so far, one of which we haven't, but we've talked about in previous hearings. Um, one is, as I said, as the overall foster care population has dropped, the proportion of uh, young people and actually older young people coming into foster care who have more complex needs has increased proportionally. Mm -hmm. and that's true across our system, and so it's also true, I think, at the Children's Center. And while that number at the Children's Center is small, um, because they stay longer, they have a disproportionate impact on the overall census because, as we've said, most of the young people leave within a, few, a matter of a few days, but a smaller number of longer stayers obviously has a disproportionate impact on, on the overall census. So I think that is one factor. Um, a second factor, which Deputy Commissioner Farber referred to earlier, is um, we have very successfully, and we're very proud of this, reduced uh, the population in our juvenile justice system uh, in New York City, and we are reducing uh, the number of uh, people in the adult criminal detention system as well. Um, but some of those uh, younger, younger and yes, younger uh, uh, individuals who um, might pre in previous years have been in the juvenile justice system or have been in detention in the adult system and no longer are, some of them don't have family resources. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we think that there be maybe more of them who are coming to the Children's Center because of course we, um, we house children up to age 21, so a higher age group than would be in the juvenile justice system. Um, and so uh, we think there are more uh, young people with juvenile or adult criminal involvement who have now uh, come into the foster care system. And the third I issue, which we have talked about in previous hearings, is the fact that we have seen some shrinkage in our residential foster care mm. system. As you know, several of our residential programs have closed over the past year or two. Mm -hmm. um, and that means we have fewer facilities available to serve some of the young people who are now staying longer at the Children's Center. We're doing a number of things to address that, which some of which I talked about in the testimony. We have actually, um, we are kind of rebuilding that capacity through uh, adding additional beds with two of our providers, one in place already, one about to be in place, a third that we're in uh, negotiations and we hope to open soon. Um, and we're also in longer term discussions with our residential providers about uh, what they need to appropriately serve these young people. Um, but I think the fact that we have experienced some challenges in our overall residential foster care system mm -hmm. has impacted the census of the Children's Center as well. Is there a lack of capacity in the, in the residential foster programs? Um, there's sufficient overall capacity, but it isn't just about numbers, of course. It's about matching each young person with 
the appropriate, most appropriate setting for them. Mm -hmm. And so you actually need really to be able to do that uh, as effectively as possible. You actually need more capacity in the system than just the numbers would suggest. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why we need to make sure we have quite a range of different options available. And so can you speak a little bit about what that range is? Um, Sure. So, I mean, sort of related to that, and the commissioner mentioned that essentially, you know, there's a, there's a small group of young people that have very high needs, and, and part of that is related to the incredible success that we've had on the juvenile justice and, and criminal justice side. Um, and so we are, we're, we're working on this issue on a number of fronts, um, and one of those fronts is um, partnering with OMH to look at um, designing new programs um, and resources for those young people. And so there are uh, intensive conversations and a, and a work group uh, of OCFS, OMH, DOHMH, and ACS that have been working on developing um, new approaches for these young people. And so one example of one of the approaches that's come out of that, and I believe the commissioner mentioned it in his testimony, is um, we've launched a partnership with DOHMH where we are referring extremely high needs foster youth to DOHMH's IMT and FACT programs. That's uh, IMT is intensive mobile treatment and FACT is forensic assertive community treatment. And those programs um, are providing um, extremely intensive um, and helpful outreach and services to young people who have serious mental illness, who've had juvenile and criminal justice involvement, and they've uh, created a very tight collaboration with the foster care agencies. So that's an example of sort of the kind of work that we're trying to do to address the needs of this you know, relatively small group of young people, but who have a, a serious set of needs. So those programs would be paired with youth in care, or those programs would be in, in care and foster care yes. group settings, or in um, at the children's center? Both. Both, okay. Yes, as well as the YRCs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and so we're, we're excited about that. The other thing is we've implemented, um, in partnership with three of our providers, Children's Village, New York Foundling, and Graham Wyndham, a new um, initiative at the Children's Center focused on family finding for the very highest needs kids and for kids mm -hmm. who are staying at the Children's Center longer. The pilot just launched um, about 30 days ago, but uh, we've already had some results, um, mm -hmm. and, and you know we're looking forward to apprising you on that moving forward. Okay. Um, Okay, I mean, I, it, I'm still wondering if there are other, other things, other drivers that are out there that we are not quite catching that have, that have gone into all of this, but I think that there's, maybe that's something that we can continue to, to examine. Um, uh, how, does, how does ACS measure success at the Children's Center in terms of how do we measure the success of an individual case? How do we measure the success of of the operations of the facility as a whole, um, kind of how how are how is ACS um, qualifying the, the the work that's being done, and and has under those metrics have has there been a cause for concern over the last several years as we've seen a sen the census increase and length of stay increase. You want to start? Well, yeah, let me start, and then I'll let uh, Dr. Mitchell. I mean, I, I think, as I said, we're really, we really have three key goals at the Children's Center. One is mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we are providing um, appropriate care and services to young people while they're there. Second is to move them as quickly as possible from the Children's Center to mm -hmm. uh, a more appropriate foster care placement. And the third is to make sure that we are uh, maintaining a safe, secure environment uh, in which young people can heal and staff feel safe. So those are really the three main things around which we frame uh, all of our work and the th by which we kind of measure our success. Let me ask Deputy Commissioner. Sure. Whatever. I mean, so so one of the measures, and I think the commissioner, you know, touched on this. Um, but we've added a tremendous amount of programming over the last two years and, and even mm -hmm. more so over the last several months. I mean, we have recreational programming, therapeutic programming, there's Carnegie Hall music programming, there's mm -hmm. yoga, there's therapy dogs. Um, the, the Children's Center staff um, 
work very, very hard and they're extremely dedicated and we have really built um, over the last two years a much more sophisticated and deep um, set of trainings. I think the commissioner might have mentioned in his testimony, I mean, just over the last couple of months, there are 19 different trainings um, that, that staff are having. Um, we're also implementing um, right now, um, you know, the Children's Center is structured by age group. So there's the infants and the toddlers, yeah. there's the young boys and girls, and then the teen boys and girls. And so we call those pods. And so each of those pods have specialized programming on a, on a weekly basis. So one of, our, one of our measures is around staff receiving training, around um, you know, the numbers of programs we have in place and the, young, the numbers of young people who are participating in those programs. We ask young people for their feedback mm -hmm. um, on those programs. Um, and so those are, you know, some examples of some of the ways that we've measure that we mm -hmm. measure the Children's Center. I mean, our our top goal is for it to be a warm, safe, uh, therapeutic environment for right. children who have just experienced removal. Yeah. Um, are there are there data points? I'm wondering just to, uh, how ACS is, um, you know, uh, monitoring performance at the Children's Center to the, in the sense that if, if things are, whether we're able to monitor uh, or identify um, uh, problems as they become apparent. Uh, so, you know, then I'll, I'll get to the case of Kenneth in a minute, but, you know, that spoke to some systemic issues. Um, it, it, I don't believe it was a kind of just a one-off or a total, um, you know, that this was just a, it, somehow this kid fell through the cracks. There, it spoke to some, some systemic issues, and so how are we identifying these things um, before they, they turn into a crisis? Mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's what I'm asking. Is what, yeah. what, what data points are we looking at to try to figure that out? No, that's, that's a great question, a very fair question. So um, we, well, as I said, you know, after, after that case, which obviously I can't talk about in detail, but mm -hmm. as a result of that, uh, uh, I immediately asked our agency medical director to do a review of every special needs child at the Children's Center to make sure that they were receiving appropriate care and services, and I'm happy to say that they were. Mm -hmm. We've now continued to do that on a weekly basis. So every week, yeah. our agency medical director nice. yeah. uh, gets a, uh, a, essentially a listing of uh, young people with special needs or high needs at the Children's Center, and we make sure that their needs are being addressed. So from a, a medical needs perspective and a service perspective, um, that's the approach that we've now implemented. Being consistently to make sure monitored. Consistently, so new weekly monitoring of every child uh, on the premises who has mm -hmm. Uh, special needs and require special kinds of care. Um, you know, with regard to each of the other uh, areas of intervention, we also track. So, for example, um, school attendance. You know, we look at every child and whether they're attending school. Yeah. Um, we look at, at uh, the degree of participation in programming. Um, so, really, with regard to each of the areas that mm -hmm. we think are essential to a child's um, well being while they're there. Mm -hmm. um, we have goals, and we uh, assess regularly whether we're meeting those goals. Okay. okay. Um, that, I mean, it's something, yeah, to conti continue to consider to ensure it's like, you know, quality review type, type work. Um, uh, so I guess I, if I, I could ask a couple questions about um, the, the case of Kenneth that, and, and, and um, uh, Judge Olshansky's ruling or a, a, a contempt order. Um, and I know you can't get into specifics, but um, there were a lot of, um, I mean, it was a fairly unprecedented um, thing for the judge to make that contempt order public, and I think that that speaks to the severity of the case and, and the, the, the lack of resources. Um, how, I guess I would, how could something like that have happened at the Children's Center? Um, how could it be that, you know, the wheelchair uh, that had been requested for a year uh, had yet to be ordered? Um, you know, how could it be that there were, you know, that he was, um, uh, had, was, was sitting in his own urine or that he didn't have access to, you know, didn't have full access to 
the bathroom and th things like that that are you know these kind of very basic things. How could it be that so that, that 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 something like that happened? Um, well, I, I what was can't, going on that <laughs> what was going on that created the conditions for something no, like that? No, I appreciate happen? that. I, I can't talk about that case. I can certainly say that um, any significant delay in getting uh, either special medical equipment or um, appropriate health or sanitary services to any young person at the Children's Center would be an enormous concern, enormous problem for us. And there's a lot that we um, have done to make sure that doesn't happen. I, I, let me ask Dr. Rao to speak a little bit to the way in which we now review um, every child, but in particular children with special medical needs, to make sure that we are responding to those needs in a timely way. Sure, good morning. Um, so the process that we have in place for any child that enters the children's center is that they uh, immediately on entry, they are triaged by our nursing staff. As um, was mentioned, we have nursing staff on hand 24 seven. We have a pediatrician, a uh, medical director in the building. We also have nurse practitioners available um, for coverage. Um, so every child is assessed when they come into the building. So they are medically assessed and physically examined. Uh, medications that they are prescribed are noted, allergies are noted. If they do have some special needs, then we do whatever we can to obtain that information as soon as possible. It's not always possible, given the nature of the setting, to receive that information immediately, but we work on uh, obtaining it as soon as we can. Uh, we also do screenings for mental health issues, including suicidality, uh, suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts. Um, and again, we review any, medic any medication information we have and psychiatric information that we have. What we then do is for the children that we have identified as having special needs, we will, where it's ap appropriate, assign them to be, for instance, on one-to-one -one supervision so that they, they have a staff member assigned to them whenever they're in the building. We will do what we can to provide um, to their needs in, a, in an individualized basis and we create care plans that are shared with the staff who will be caring for that child uh, to ensure that every child receives a level of care that's uh, sufficient for their needs. And this is done for, uh, as well for, for children that are current long stayers at the Children's Center, so not just upon intake because since these protocols have gone into place there are probably young people that are that were there then that are still there, right? Abs absolutely, this is an ongoing process. Um, so any child with medical needs is being uh, regularly checked by uh, nursing staff and they are interacting with them on uh, a daily basis, especially if they're uh, receiving any kind of medication, then they'll be seen, you know, commensurate with whatever the time is that they need to take the medication. And then we're reviewing whether we're meeting needs on an ongoing basis as a team. As uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber mentioned, we have uh, pods, the children are divided into pods in the building, and we have regular pod meetings that include a multidisciplinary approach with childcare workers, social workers, nursing staff, medical staff, mental health care staff. Um, uh, one other thing around uh, the case of, of Kenneth is that Judge Olshansky issued a contempt order because previous orders were not complied with. Um, how are we ensuring that um, uh, orders of the courts are, are, are being complied with in a timely fashion so that we don't get to a situation where in, uh, we're in contempt, mm -hmm. uh, especially on important matters? Absolutely. Uh, well, again, without discussing that particular case, what we do is, you know, it requires essentially coordination among our family court legal services attorneys who are in court, who are right. speaking directly to the judges about their, uh, their orders with regard to young people in foster care. Um, and then depending on the status of the child, um, our Division of Family Permanency Services under Deputy Commissioner Farber to make sure that the, uh, the orders are being carried out and sometimes our Division mm -hmm. of Child Protection as well if they're still engaged with the child. So, so there's case conferencing on that? I'm sorry? So there would be case conferencing between? Yes the ACS attorney, perhaps the legal aid attorney as well, or is that not the, the representing the child? Well, there's certainly discussions in court among the attorneys right. for the uh, child but, but and going the over parent, to but within ACS, ACS right. yes, okay. we would have our own conferencing that so the family court legal services attorney essentially would carry back mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the proceedings in court mm -hmm. to our staff within family permanency or child protection, um, and they would work together to make sure that the needs of the child were met in accordance with the orders of the court. Was that not happening 
previously or? It, it was happening um, okay. and it continues to happen. It is a, you know, often a complex procedure. We obviously have a very large volume of cases in court. Um, but we, we do it and obviously we right. will. But we don't have that many young people at the children's center. So that's, that's the thing is, you know, it's a fairly discrete population. Each, if there's 80 young people, I mean, each, each one can get fairly robust individual attention. Right. So, you know, that's, it's not as if there's a, you know, there, we're case conferencing on, on the entire, you know, child, child, Every child that has a, a court case. This is, yeah. this is a well, very specific yes. Topic. No, you're right. And and again, without without speaking to that case, I will say, as with everything that we do at ACS, um, we learn from our experiences in order to improve mm -hmm. the way that we do our work and the services that we're providing to young people and to their families. Um, and uh, that has certainly been true here. We have learned a good deal from that experience and other experiences that we've had. Um, I I'm going to ask just. Uh, a couple of questions really quickly about education, then uh, Professor Landry, do you have questions? Um, so uh, with education, um, Mr. Chair, your, your questioning is very thorough. Thank you. I'm enjoying <laughs> learning about this issue by hearing you in this dialogue, but I, I'm confident you have it well covered. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, with education, you spoke to, in your testimony, um, uh, kind of how we're ensuring that uh, children are able to stay in their home school and uh, get to school. Um, who, is there anyone at the Children's Center that is, particularly for youth that are um, staying for extended periods of time, that uh, that's like helping the kids do their homework? Like who, who's fulfilling that role that a foster parent would fill? Or if they're in a group home that a you know that their that their case planner or social worker would 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 perform, or obviously in a family situation that the parent would perform. So um, that would be the child care staff. I mean, those are the staff who are on the pods and they're working with the kids on a daily basis and they're counseling them, they're playing with them, they're playing mm -hmm. ping pong with them, they're helping them with their homework. Um, okay. As I think the commissioner mentioned, we also have DOE programs on site for the young people. Um, and uh, we always work to keep them in their home school and we have you know, uh, transportation to school. Um, and so they're supported in that way by the child care staff. Mm -hmm. Um, are we able, do we have good data on school attendance and um, and arriving at school on time and those those metrics and how are they comparing to the general population and how are they comparing also to um, uh, youth in the shelter system? So I don't have that data with me and we'll have to go back and, and check. We do have a DOE data match um, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure actually whether how we can separate out the, the children's center kids. So we'll, we can get back to you about that. Um, but every day, um, the vast majority of the kids at the Children's Center are attending school. We also have um, an education unit that is under my division um, that has staff who are dedicated to working on all sorts of educational issues for children in foster care, including having a dedicated education specialist at the Children's Center itself. Okay. Yeah, uh, so how are the kids transported to school? So they are um, transported through um, either ACS transportation or contracted transportation. Like buses or uh, you want to address lifts that? and Ubers? Deputy Commissioner Saunders oversees all the transportation. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. So they are transported with 15 um, passenger vehicles or sometimes uh, car service, just regular cars unmarked, mm -hmm. and they go to school. Um, and so I guess it would be good to know kind of how the, what the attendance uh, metrics are and whether it's, how it's matching with the general population. Um, obviously these, these children are, are uh, experiencing significant trauma and um, the, the benefit of being in school and the kind of um, normalizing uh, kind of, uh, effect that that has is, is I think a significant benefit to their lives and so making sure that they're they're in school is as much as possible is, is, a, is a benefit what about after-school programming are they able to 
um, access school-based after-school programming, and if they're not, because that's a challenge in the, in the shelter system, children that are in the shelter system don't have access to school-based after-school programming um, uh, because of transportation issues. And uh, so are, 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 are these children experiencing the same thing? And if they are, what about after-school programming on site? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, it's you know, critical that kids get to continue not just school, but other activities, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's sports or drama or um, after-school programs. And so the kids at the Children's Center are able to continue doing after-school programming if we, you know, we pick them up after their after-school program. If, okay. um, uh, and then, of course, I, as I mentioned, we have all of the programming that happens on site at the Children's Center. But um, we work mm -hmm. to continue you know, all of the child's activities. If they're in the chess club, they can still go to the chess club. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit, if that's OK. Um, so, uh, sorry, the, the, the first, uh, I want to ask about the, the 144 new therapeutic foster care slots. Um, are those new slots or have they been moved over from other, from other uh, capacity elsewhere in the system? We, we moved the slots. Um, okay. They were unused slots, um, and so we did an analysis and moved those slots to agencies um, that had uh, were demonstrating um, exceptional success around foster home recruitment. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I want to ask about the uh, the host homes program and what what happened there. There was uh, my understanding is that there were contracts that didn't draw down the funds or. Drew, drew down a yeah. very small portion of the funds, yep. um, and you know this is with larger providers, uh, Children's Aid Society, um, and was that a you know an attempt at a program that just didn't work? Um, I think is it, I guess my I'm wondering whether conceptually whether it was a good idea and whether it's worth another trying it again or or whether it was just not a, a model that just didn't seem to work here in the yeah. city for whatever reason. Thank you for asking. And this is also the benefit of a demonstration program where you get mm -hmm. to test something and um, sort of see you know whether you want to scale it or or adjust. Um, but so. In this instance, the host home program was, the, the notion was essentially establishing a group of foster homes that would be set aside and would only be used for very short term placements, you know, less than 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and so we did make a few placements, Children's Aid um, did develop a few of those homes and YAP provided services, um, but essentially, that was in 2017 at a time when our need for just generally available foster homes um, had become very significant. And so it was not feasible at that time to set aside a group of foster homes for emergency uh, homes only. Mm -hmm. Since then, um, we, we've uh, you know really done a deep dive into the research on sort of you know whether you set aside emergency homes or not. There are certainly some jurisdictions that do it, and and many others that don't. Our focus right now, um, as you know, you've heard a lot about our Home Away from Home initiative, which has been very successful, um, is to increase the overall foster home pool mm -hmm. um, such that in that overall pool we will have enough foster homes for that sort of thing for having emergency or respite care without necessarily setting aside homes that will only provide emergency or respite care and so from 2017 to 18, we had a 32% increase in new foster homes and we're on track for a similar increase from 18 to 19. Uh, let me also just add as context, uh, as you know, Chair, that um, we are in the process of planning uh, for the next generation of our foster care system. Mm -hmm. um, and we will be later this year um, releasing concept paper, concept paper for our, uh, the next iteration of our foster care system and our residential system. So all of this experience is playing into the way we're thinking about the future right. design of the system. And in the interim, there are some limitations from a procurement perspective about what we can do. So the reason, for example, that we reallocated slots from provider to provider is that uh, until we do a new RFP, we can't actually put new slots um, out into the market, but we can look at make, making sure that we're achieving the best utilization of our existing slots. Um, that all said, there seems to be, a, 
for the particular issue that we're seeing at the Children's Center, a need for shorter term, and that might not be 30 days, it may be 90 days or 120 days, for families that are willing and equipped to take high needs, older youth. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, if I'm not mistaken, that is what we're saying is driving the higher census at the Children's Center, the ongoing persistent higher census at the Children's Center is higher needs, older youth. Um, and so, there, I, while it's, I think it's very important to achieve the objective of creating a larger pool of foster parents, that's a very specific subset of foster parents that are willing to do that. Um, can you speak a little bit to, to that and whether that, that very specific um, uh, pool is, is, is being targeted? Yeah, you're exactly right. You've honed in on it. Um, and so part of the work within that home away from home recruitment is actually focused on recruitment for older youth. Um, and in fact, our data show that about 50% of our foster parents have fostered an older youth. Um, and so a lot of the work that we're doing is around um, building supports for existing experienced foster parents. So for example, creating what we call hub homes where you have an experienced foster parent who's providing support to a small group of foster parents who all live in the same neighborhood or the same apartment building, right? And, um, and that way that group can feel that support from one another. So that's one example. The other example is the family finding pilot that I mentioned of the three uh, foster care agencies at the Children's Center. So that work is very focused on these older high needs youth and in uh, finding family and then putting in place the um, preventive service um, interventions, family support interventions that we have in our evidence-based continuum mm -hmm. of um, prevention services to support those families to be able to ma maintain those young people you know, safely and, and have them thrive. And then the other thing I would mention again is just the work that we're doing with OMH and DOHMH um, around uh, developing more intensive services that can go to the children where they are, whether they're you know, on their way home or they're in a residential setting and they're struggling or they're in a foster home and they're struggling. What are the, um, what are the likely out, um, outcomes for uh, youth that are the longer term um, stayers at the children's center? So where, where eventually um, will they be going? Are they going uh, or, or today or over the last year or two? Where have they been going at the end of their stay at the Children's Center? Well, I mean, most, most children um, exiting the Children's Center are going to foster homes. I mean, I, I think you know that we have a very low poor proportion of children in foster care in New York City who are in congregate care settings, who are mm -hmm. in residential settings. Our proportion is about 9%. Um, you know, that's very low, both in New York State and nationally. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, we're continuing to advance that work in terms of uh, maintaining a low reliance on congregate care and really only using that for, for young people who have behavioral or other needs that require that and continuing to increase kinship and family care across mm -hmm. the system. And that's what, so, that, so they mostly, young people have been mostly going into foster homes after, as an example, so staying at the Children's Center for nine months. Um, they eventually, I mean, what, what's the process by which that happens and why does it take, why has it been taking so long? Is it just because it's making the match with a foster family that's, that's, that, 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 that could take that long to do? Some of it is making the match, um, and some of it is the, the issues around young people with just very significant needs. Mm -hmm. um, and then what is the type of aftercare that is done? Is, is there, is in a, if a, a youth is placed with a, foster, with a foster family, is there then a continued, I mean, I, I suppose that there's, the, 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 there's uh, there are cases handed off to the, the foster care agency, um, which, which has that program? 
That's right. So, so when a, a youth is then, you know, placed in a in a foster home or a residential program, mm -hmm. the, the assigned foster care agency assumes mm -hmm. all of the case planning and case management responsibility, mm -hmm. and they're working on, you know, all of the child's needs mm -hmm. in terms of ensuring they're safe in the foster home, their education needs, permanency planning, all of that. All of that is handled by the foster care agency and reviewed by the court. Um, you said that you're, you're, um, you have a, a Dropbox that's available for feedback, anonymous feedback. What has the feedback been so far, and how are you compiling that? So um, we do have uh, an anonymous suggestion box, but um, I will also say that the young people are not shy at all about sharing uh -huh. their um, their opinions, which is wonderful. Um, and so they share them all the time. Um, we do focus groups with young people, um, you know, where they where they share their ideas. Um, they they um, typically will submit ideas about food. Um, yesterday, uh, Associate Commissioner Chu and I were talking. A young person requested um, a certain kind of cereal. I think it might have been Frosted Flakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so they make requests about food, they make requests about programming, they might make requests about um, you know, wanting uh, certain types of trips, wanting certain types of uh, makeup or shampoo, um, and then we fulfill those. Um, and so there's an Excel spreadsheet um, with the list of all of the suggestions that young people have made, and then we, we follow up and, and take care of them. Um, what's the age breakdown? I don't know, maybe uh, Keith asked this, that, uh, and is, is, it, is, is that a kind of thing that fluctuates, or does it say fairly static in terms of the, the proportion of age groups? So the age breakdown um, is uh, about a quarter, uh, zero to three. Um, 14 percent, we can provide this to you, obviously. Um, four to six, 17 percent, seven to 10, 13 percent, 11 to 13. 31 percent, 14 to 18. Yeah. So that's a third, a third are over the age of 14 or 14 year old or. Yep. Um, and has that changed? Has that, is that, I mean, I understand that there's, I understand that, that there's the, I understand the proportion of the, the foster care system as preventive services have come on online and, and as the census continues to uh, reduce, the proportion of kind of older, higher needs uh, children uh, is, is greater. Yep. But, the, but the, the, the number itself isn't necessarily greater. That, that, I mean, that's one thing I just, around the, the census here that I'm, I'm having a little bit difficulty wrapping my head around. The proportion should, should, could, could be higher, but the raw number itself should continue to decline. It, you know, I could see the the average length of stay going up um, as it's you know as there as it's weighted more towards uh, uh, older, higher needs children. But I but I don't I don't quite understand why the number itself is higher, other than the, the more calls coming into SCR. But I don't know why. They, I mean, these are older children. Are, they, are there are there more calls coming in for children over the age of fourteen? You know, I, 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 just to play this out for a second, you know, in response to a high-profile case involving a toddler or a very young child under the age of six, you know, I could see there being, you know, a, or under the age of eight or under the age of ten. But but for older children, 14 years old or older, are there more calls coming in as response to a high-profile case? Uh, for older children? No, I don't think we have any evidence. I think the issue is, and I'm, uh, I'm not a mathematician, so I, I'm not sure I explain it too well, but I think I think really does have to do with length of stay. So that even if the same proportion of, of children are coming in in that age bracket, let's say 14 to 18, if they are more likely to be long stayers, exactly. it has a disproportionate impact on the overall census of the children's center. So, you know, obviously the difference between you know, uh, 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 an infant coming in and staying for one or two or three days, mm -hmm. and an older young person coming in and staying for 30 days magnifies the impact that has on the overall census. So it may not be a shift in the age distribution of entries, but it could be a significant shift in the age distribution in the entire uh, census at a point in time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not a mathematician <laughs> either. Just, um, okay. Uh, Talk a little bit about security. Um, there, 
There was a, uh, an incident a couple of years ago, obviously, that um, was well, well publicized where young, a six-year-old was um, assaulted by a, uh, a worker um, who had a, uh, had a, a pretty significant um, um, background um, that, was, that was not known or was known but not taken into account. Um, what, what, is the, what are the metrics that we're using for security to understand whether or not we're successful as a, when it comes to security? And then what are, what, what are we doing to, to ensure the ongoing safety? I know you've, you've mentioned a few um, in terms of personnel and, and the like, but I guess what are, what are we looking at in terms of uh, our uh, dashboard for um, our, our, whether we're going the right or wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Well, let me begin by saying a little bit about uh, the incident you referenced and what we've done since then around um, clearances for staff, and then I'll ask Deputy Commissioner Saunders to talk about generally what we're doing to enhance security. Um, so after that uh, incident, uh, we want, needed to make sure that all staff uh, working at the Children's Center, and for that matter, uh, in other ACS facilities, at our detention centers, our child protective special, and others were being um, appropriately cleared um, before they were uh, given any position where they would be in contact with children. We had begun shortly after I became commissioner in 2017, um, we began doing um, full clearance checks through both the OCFS SCR system and the Just State Justice Center, um, prospectively for newly hired staff. Uh, after, subsequent to that incident, we went retrospectively back to, I think, staff that have been hired as far back as 2013 or 2014, but were still employed by ACS uh, to make sure that they, too, were fully cleared through both the OCFS system and the Justice Center system. Um, we have now achieved that, so we're now in a situation where we are confident that um, all of our staff at the Children's Center and all of our staff in other situations where they may have um, uh, regular uh, supervised or unsupervised contact with children um, are fully cleared through all of the state background checks. So um, that issue we've made tremendous progress on. With regard to general security procedures and enhancements we've made, let me ask Deputy Commissioner Saunders to speak to that. Sure. So as you know, in order to create a therapeutic environment, kids must feel safe as well as staff. So some of the ways in which we continue to uh, continuously assess our environment to ensure it's safe is um, through a, a variety of different ways, some traditional, some non-traditional. So one, of course, we focus on the infrastructure, on the physical enhancements of the facility to ensure that we remove any dangers that might be right in front of us. So like the cords for the um, window shades. We remove them, we place them up very high so they cannot be reached by anyone. Um, in addition to that, we've expanded some of our security screening areas so that we ensure that there's enough space for youth to travel in as well as the placement of peace officers there. In addition to that, we focus on training of our peace officers. Our peace officers are integrated into multidisciplinary groups within the children's centers so that we're all speaking the same language, we're all aligned on the de-escalation techniques and crisis management. Um, we really are focusing on our approach on how we treat and how we support some of our youth that are coming into the center. Um, in addition, aside from just some of, some of the traditional ways, we're also looking at the different types of programming that we can offer our youth because we don't want a cookie cutter approach to addressing the needs of our kids. Thank you. Um, there, we have in our report the number of calls that went in, the number of 911 calls from the Children's Center over a six month period was pretty astounding. Um, I don't have it in front of me. There's about 600 calls that went in over six, uh, 400 calls maybe that went in under a six month period. Um, how are we, I mean, how are we tracking that and why would there be so many 911 calls in, in such a relatively short period of time? We, well, we have to confirm those numbers, and we're happy to, if you want to share them with us, we can take a look and, and, uh, and confirm them. But, um, 
you know, initially, as, as Deputy Commissioner Saunders said, and I'll let her speak to this further, um, we, um, you know, we utilize our ACS peace officers um, to provide safety at the facility. Um, and um, our goal is when there are incidents, and, and sometimes they are, is to use our safe crisis management de-escalation techniques um, to keep them from becoming any more serious than necessary. Um, the other thing that we have actually just begun to do um, at the Children's Center, which we're actually very excited about the potential of, is using restorative justice. Um, is actually um, um, responding after the fact to work with the young people and the staff to talk about what happened and see if we can intervene in a way that not only de-escalates that situation, but also limits the possibility um, of other situations like that developing in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and what does the partnership with the NYPD look like? Uh, and has there been um, has there been an, uh, an increase at all in, our, in, our, in arrest rates? I know that the, with the issue of, of um, uh, the, the kind of the, the civil arrests that were being made, um, but it, has there been a, any, any increase in arrests as a result of uh, a partnership with the NYPD? And what does the partnership look like? Yeah, no, I don't think so. The partnership with the NYPD, as I said in the testimony, really has two components to it. One of it is, is really service oriented. Um, the, actually, the, the 13th Precinct has been um, terrific in terms of our helping with our engagement of young people. Uh, they've come in, they've done safety trainings for young people, they've had basketball games, mm -hmm. police athletic league games you know, with, with the young people, um, they provide mentors for young people. So there's been a lot of engagement uh, between officers from the precinct and, and the young people, and in particular the neighborhood coordination officers from the precinct. Um, the other area, obviously, is in the, the surrounding, the periphery of the Children's Center, where it is, uh, obviously, like everywhere in the city, it is NYPD's responsibility to maintain a, a safe and secure environment. Mm -hmm. And they have been helpful there, too, in terms of um, enhanced patrols, um, uh, security lighting, things like that on the outside, and participating, as we've talked about, in our uh, community advisory board and our other community activities. So um, really, the two areas where our engagement with NYPD is focused has been um, services and engagement of young people within the facility and um, assistance with safety and security in the external environment. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us the arrest data from the Children's Center? Sure, we can do that. Um, in aggregate, obviously. Yes. Um, uh, so so our, our data was that, or what we have in our report is from January 1 to the end of July, January, uh, sorry, the end of July 2016, so that would be a little over a six month period, seven month period. Uh, 911 calls 600 times uh, from the Children's Center and 474 complaint reports, mostly for missing persons. Um, I don't know if that's referring to the complaint reports or, or the 911 calls or both, but uh, obviously 600 911 calls in seven months. It's a, you know that's uh, like you know was it three or four a day? Like that's a, that's a, a an enormous. Uh, a number of calls, and I mean, is that something that is typical, that there would be four 911 calls a day from the Children's Center? So, and, and Dr. Rao, I think, can, can add a little bit to this, um, but the, the vast majority of the calls relate to young people who are unfortunately having a mental health crisis um, and may need to be hospitalized. And so, as I think we've all talked about, um, you know, staff are trained around de-escalation, and then, of course, we have um, psychiatrists and psychologists and pediatrician and nurses and, and social workers and child care staff on site. Um, but we also know that these are extremely traumatized children who have experienced abuse and neglect, um, and sometimes there are instances um, in which um, you know children need to be hospitalized to receive proper mental health care. And that requires um, a 911 call to do that. Uh, sometimes, um, when there needs to be support. Yeah. So I would say that um, you know, as we mentioned, we have the um, mental health team on site, which is made up of employees of NYU Bellevue. So we enjoy a, a very good relationship with Bellevue Hospital next door. Um, not all of these instances of 911 calls are because of some kind of aggressive incident. It could be that a child feels unsafe um, because they're experiencing suicidal thoughts or thoughts of self-harm. And then just as a precaution, we call 911 to ensure that they're escorted safely mm -hmm. uh, across the street to Bellevue. So it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know, there's been some danger presented to anyone in the building. And then there is a relatively smaller number of 911 calls made for medical 
reasons for medical emergencies. So mm. we have medical staff on site, but obviously if it escalates to a level where it's not safely manageable in the children's center, then we will call 911 in those situations also. Is it possible for us to get um, uh, data on the 911 calls kind of um, aggregated but disaggregated for uh, for types of for reason for call health related safety related etc some some way to break that down well we'll have to see how we categorize it but we'll provide to you whatever mm -hmm. information we have okay um we've been joined by councilmember credentic two graduations later <laughs> you, you, you have questions right? uh, too early. okay um uh, I'd like to ask, I guess, a couple, jump over to the, the, the legislation. So you, you spoke a little bit about that we don't have um, the data. You don't have the data that we're asking for now, but you may be able to get that if, um, if the uh, arrangement with OCFS moves forward. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Um, yes. Well, first of all, let me say, as, as I said in the testimony, we, we would very much like to have access to those data as well. On an ag we do. Uh, certainly have access to the data on an individual basis. We can track individual utilization of psychiatric medications, but it would be helpful to have it on an aggregate basis as well. Um, Chair, as you'll recall, I'm sure very well from the Foster Care Task Force, one of the uh, task force recommendations, which we um, enthusiastically um, agreed with, was uh, to seek access to the state's psyche system which is a web-based system that pulls data from the state Medicaid system on a number of healthcare indicators, but including um, prescription medication. Um, if, if and when we get access to that database, um, we think that will then provide us with aggregate information about psychiatric medication utilization for young people in foster care. Um, we've been in discussions for actually some time now since the uh, end of the foster care task force recommendation process with initially the Office of Mental Health um, and now more recently with OCFS. Um, and um, we think, we think we're think we optimistic that we this will be successful and the state seems responsive. Uh, the challenge is that it requires both access to the psyche system and uh, then an IT connection um, between the psyche system and the uh, state child welfare connection system so that we can identify the young people in foster care and, and link the Medicaid data to those particular young people. Um, so we're currently in discussions with OCFS around the, both the IT systems and security requirements that would enable that to happen. Um, but they, you know, this, our state partners seem responsive and so we're optimistic that we'll be successful. Um, the other uh, a possible approach, as I mentioned in testimony, is that when um, children in foster care in New York State move into Medicaid managed care, which is currently slated to happen in October of this year, although it has been slated to happen earlier, <laughs> and that has, that deadline has been pushed back a couple of times. But again, if and when that does happen, um, that again, we understand, will require that there be a connection between the state Medicaid database and the connections database, again, to identify children in foster care who would be moved into managed care, and that could provide another opportunity for us to get access to the, uh, the data on psychiatric medication aggregate. So, we're very hopeful that between those two options, one of them will come to fruition, and as soon as it does, um, we'd be happy at that point to uh, come back to you and have discussions about what data we could report to you and to the public. Okay. Um, now, I'm gonna really jump around here, <laughs> so I'm going, I might be returning to old topics and um, jumping from topic to topic. Um, uh, in terms of staffing at the Children's Center, is there, 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 there are social workers there? Yes, there are. Uh, how many social workers? Well, there's 237, I think, staff total. Um, I don't know the number of social workers off the top of my head. Okay, so 14 or 15. Okay. Um, and we're gonna be adding a bunch with the 90 staff that the commissioner mentioned. Um, with budget, uh, what is the, the, do we have a breakdown of, of children's center budget, like specifically for children's center staff and, and OTPS, and then um, uh, has that increased in, in FY20 or FY19 and FY20? Yeah, there, 
how is uh, how are the how is this uh, how are these resources uh, coming to the Children's Center in the existing ACS budget? We do have a budget, and we can uh, obviously break that out and supply that to mm -hmm. you. Uh, budget for um, administration, operation, administration, and then a budget for um, personnel services. Um, so we can give you that information. In terms of the new staff. Um, we've initially been given hiring authority by OMB, so okay. we can get that process going immediately. That's that's the goal. And then, the, and then the the, the budgetary um, uh, allocation or impact for that will be addressed in a in a uh, in a budget modification. We will the we'll year. handle it as much as we're able to within existing resources. Uh -huh. um, but obviously, should that create challenges for us in terms of uh, competition with other you know critical ACS needs, we would then have to look at uh, at other ways to handle that. But for the moment, we'll be uh, we'll be doing it out of existing resources and using the hiring authority that we've been given. Okay. Um, is there, th are there th Thrive resources that are, uh, have been uh, allocated to the Children's Center? There are no direct Thrive resources uh, going to the Children's Center. I believe that the DOHMH programs that we will now be utilizing that we discussed uh, in testimony and that Deputy Commissioner Farber referred to are Thrive programs. Okay. Um, it might be interesting to see if there are Thrive programs that can be um, uh, accessed directly by ACS at the Children's Center. Obviously, there a lot of issues around, um, I mean, every child that enters the ch Children's Center is experiencing trauma. Trauma uh, you know, involves mental health. So it would make some sense that in uh, uh, an initiative with, with such an extensive uh, budget and reach, um, that we were going to we'd be uh, helping truly the most vulnerable people in the entire city of New York who we have the greatest responsibility for. I don't have to remind you that you are, you know, every child that's in the care, has been removed from their home is, 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 in, is in the care of the commissioner of ACS, which is you. Uh, so you, you have yes. to. <laughs> I am very kind. And uh, absolutely, and, and we can take a look at that. And obviously, we are um, quite. Uh, happy and eager to access any resource that we think will be helpful for the young people that mm -hmm. we're serving. And okay. we also, of course, have our Bellevue team on site. Yes. Right, yeah. right. And the pro I mean, I'm assuming the proximity uh, helps in terms of coordination, right? Absolutely. It's extremely helpful. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so we reviewed previous um, testimony uh, from ACS over the years. And the initial, we, we had heard earlier reporting saying that the center was built for, fifth, for a capacity of 55, and you testified that it uh, currently has a capacity of 101 or 105. Is that, do you know what that is, that 55 number? Have you seen that before? I'm not sure where the 55 number comes from. We, we definitely have an operating certificate from OCFS for 101. Okay. Um, can we, Circle back with you on that to see why that was, uh, you know, why that was initially stated to be that, and kind of certainly um, talk through that. Um, is there a, uh, a clearly prescribed review process for violent incidents, um, and and has that changed over time, or been amended in any way? Uh, there is. I'll let uh, either of the deputy commissioners speak to that. We, uh, you know, there, there are several actually because we are required uh, to report certain incidents to the state justice center, mm -hmm. uh, and we do in those situations. And then we, of course, have our own incident uh, response protocols as well. So let me uh, defer to one of my colleagues to talk about them. Yeah, you covered sort of the, the two important pieces. So, um, you know, we, we follow justice center protocols and report any incident that meets any of the criteria for justice center reporting. And then for our own purposes, um, you know, there's an immediate debrief um, around incidents to ensure that children are okay, that staff are okay. Um, as the commissioner mentioned, we're now um, beginning to implement restorative justice practices, um, which are uh, can be very important um, in such instances. We also have. Um, uh, safety committee meetings where incidents are reviewed by the cross-disciplinary team um, that includes, you know, social workers, the peace officers, the child care staff, um, and we look at 
Uh, how did the incident come about? What can we learn from that incident? Um, are there other ways that we can support children and staff? It's an important part of our practice um, is to review and learn from any incident that occurs. Um, okay, thank you. Um, with regard to the youth reception centers, um, have they have they have they shown themselves to be more effective um, at than than the children's center at first for higher need or older populations in terms of reducing uh, a walls or other uh, critical incidents? So. Um, They've certainly been effective in that um, since they are exclusively focused on older youth, the staffing, the programming, the structure, the facilities are all focused around teenagers. Um, and so that um, uh, I think has been a, definitely a benefit and a positive. Um, how come they haven't reduced, because when we're talking about the census at the Children's Center, I'm assuming that we're not including the youth reception centers. So. Um, uh, how come we haven't seen a reduction? We still have, uh, if the, we're showing that there are no children over the age of 18 um, in April of 2019 residing at the Children's Center, and almost 50% are between 14 and 18, so, you know, that, that's a, we're talking about uh, 30, 35 kids that are between 14 and 18. Um, if they're better, place in a youth reception, reception center, um, how come we're not seeing that, that uh, population decrease at the children's center itself? So I, I think it comes back to the, the mathematical discussion earlier. Um, the youth reception centers are, are typically um, fully occupied. It's only 30 beds um, at the- Should we increase it? At the three youth reception centers. Should well, we I mean- If they're better, are they better? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are they- more appropriate for older, older So, I mean, it's certainly our goal is to reduce, you know, the population at the Children's Center, you know, as low as possible, as the commissioner said earlier, um, and ideally to be able to have uh, fewer and fewer older youth there, you know, and so that's the nature of all the work um, that we mentioned to mm -hmm. achieve that. Um, I mean, the, the continued census, um, both at the YRCs and the Children's Center, again, is the result of a small group of young people who are staying longer, right? And so they are, they're on the census, you know, so if a young person, as I think the commissioner said earlier, is um, at the Children's Center for 30 days or at the YRC for 45 days, right? They're on that census every single day, which is different from the vast majority of children mm -hmm. who are in and out in one day. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is, the, that is the, the primary cause of the issue. And um, you know, as you heard the you know, commissioner and I and, and others um, talk, there's a, you know, a number of strategies underway. It's, it's not a problem that's solvable overnight, but I think we think we're on the right track with the range of um, efforts and our partnerships with OMH uh, and others to try and tackle it. What's the outer range of length of stay? What, what, how, what's the longest stay? At the Children's Center? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, you know, it's fortunately not, not typical, but um, I don't you know, have to get back to you on the data. But a, uh, I mean, over a year, I'm assuming, right? Kenneth was there for a year. That's very, very, very atypical. Right. Um, I mean, you know, right now, I think we have, I don't know, today, I think we have, uh, you know, 20 kids that are there over 20 days. I don't have it right in front of me, but it's it's something like that. But over six months, I mean, is that? There's it? nobody there who's over six months. Oh, okay. No. Mm -mm. Okay. No. Um, that's that's good. And then and then there's that, nobody there who's over three months actually. Right oh. Now. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's the same for the youth reception centers. Are we, are are they? Are is these kind of critical data? Are they kind of? Uh, you know, these important data points, are they tracking between the Children's Center and the Youth Reception Center? Yes, okay. both. I don't actually have the YRC data in front of me, but we also track that. Okay. Um, okay. Um, with, with the residential facilities, I'm, I'm I mean, 
I'm concerned about the closure of residential facilities that, that, that has such an impact on this. Um, why, has, why have there been these closures? Can you speak a little bit about, I, I mean, I realize that probably each one has their own set of circumstances. Yeah, uh, well, each is, each is individual, but unfortunately some of the pressures have been common, and uh, these have basically been facilities not in the city, uh, in Westchester County, um, where there have been community pressures uh, exerted on the agencies that run them. In one case, the actual closure, and a couple of cases, at least uh, closure of intake into the, the system. So uh, it really has been uh, community and political pressures that impacted on those particular providers in those particular geographic locations. Um, okay. Um, and is there, I mean, are there, are there, there, are there plans to kind of work within the five boroughs to um, yes. establish more? Yes, in fact, uh, one of the providers that, um, that closed a facility in Westchester is, has opened uh, one within the five boroughs. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I spoke in the testimony to a couple of providers that are uh, expanding, um, Abbott House and Carl McCloskey. We have a third which we think is, is uh, in the process of doing so. So we absolutely are working hard to to restore that capacity, but we also, as you acknowledge, Chair, we, you know, our, our real goal as much as possible is to serve children in family settings. And so as much as we can develop therapeutic family settings where uh, foster parents can appropriately care for kids, even if they are higher need kids, with appropriate support services, that not only is what we much prefer to do, we think it's better for young people, uh, but also one of the things we haven't referenced is uh, the new federal family first legislation, which goes into effect in New York in about two years, is going to require the state as much as possible to reduce uh, the number and the proportion of young people in foster care who are in congregate residential yeah. uh, settings. Now, w in New York City, we utilize congregate care much, much less than the rest of the state does. So we are actually much further along in that process, uh, but we still will be working very closely with OCFS to see where we can continue to reduce the proportion of kids in foster care in residential settings, which we also think is good practice. What, have there been new and innovative ideas in terms of foster care, foster parent recruitment uh, uh, out there in the kind of, around the country? Uh, you would think in a city of eight and a half million people that we'd be able to get, uh, a f you know, a couple dozen more uh, that are willing to work with with uh, older older youth that have uh, that have challenges. So um, this is an area that we're really proud of. Um, you know, around the country, um, there's been reports that they're experiencing, um, you know, reductions in foster parents. And, and up until the last two years, that was the case here. Um, the, the prior six years, there had been a decline in the number of new foster homes recruited every year for six years. And then over the last two years, we've implemented this Home Away From Home partnership, um, Home Away From Home initiative in partnership with national experts, action research, and public catalyst, and we have implemented um, best practice strategies that have resulted in our having a 30% really? increase um, in, in recruitment last year, and we're on track for somewhere around that um, again this year. So that's real, uh, real improvement. That yes, yeah. It's significant, and then that combined with our initiatives that you're familiar with around increasing kin, those mm -hmm. two things are, are hand in glove. Mm -hmm. um, new kinship coordinators at the Children's Center, that's... So we have 10 kinship specialists who are placed in the DCP offices, the Division of Child Protection, and the Division of Child Protection has significantly increased the placement of children with kin over the past year and a half um, mm -hmm. under the leadership of my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher. Um, they've made tremendous strides so that fewer and fewer children have to spend you know, even a night um, with someone that they don't know. And then the foster care agencies work to move children to kin who do come in um, non-kinship foster placements. And so this is an initiative um, that's a, a recommendation of the task force and, and a focus, a uh, huge focus for ACS that um, we're, we've been very successful at. And, and, um, and obviously, the, it's important because you know all the research as well as common sense shows that you know kinship care is better for kids. Is there? I'm, I'm, there, I'm assuming there's a relationship, but I'm curious what the relationship look like looks like between DCP and the Children's Center. Uh, who is who's doing the contact? How how are they sharing information? Um, you know, 
to obviously to av avoid going there in the first place, the first step there is with DCP, right? Yes, um, and, and, and so yes, the relationship between DCP um, and, the, and the Children's Center staff is a, is a very tight relationship, um, and there's uh, many, many different processes for information sharing um, and coordination between the Children's Center staff and the DCP staff who have been involved, obviously, in the mm -hmm. investigation that's led to a child's removal. Right. Um, has that been, is that, is it, is that relationship uh, changing in any way, or is there, are there kind of additional practices that we're looking at to enhance that relationship? I would say um, that there's been a huge focus um, uh, on improving that relationship and tightening that collaboration and um, creating um, protocols that ensure that all the information that DCP has is shared with the Children's Center, is shared with the medical team um, at the Children's Center. Um, another piece uh, of work that we've implemented is when um, children at, are at the Children's Center um, for uh, longer than 14 days, their case planning is taken over by someone at the Children's Center. Um, so it's no longer handled by a DCP investigator, mm -hmm. um, which makes sense for, for all the reasons that you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here earlier for your testimony, Commissioner. Um, lots of graduations this morning. Um, you mentioned on page 16 that you don't have access to the data that we're currently seeking, but that you would work that out. Now, ACS is responsible for these children. Is there a reason currently in law why we don't have access to data? Yes, uh, good question, Council Member. So we do have access to the data uh, uh, on individual children. Um, so we know every single child, or we have access to the data through the foster care agencies and the medical audits that we do with the foster care agencies. What we don't have access to is aggregate data on the entire foster care population. And the reason for that is that that, med that data is maintained in the Medicaid system, which the state runs, and the state has privacy requirements around that system. Um, that don't normally require access outside of providers. Um, we believe we need access. We believe that would, it would help us to have more visibility into the utilization of psychiatric medications across our whole population. And so we've been making the case to the state, and we hope successfully um, to grant us that access through the Office of Mental Health System, which is called Psyches, which pulls data out of the Medicaid system specifically around psychiatric issues and, and psychological issues. All right, thank you, Commissioner. I just, it seems to me, um, to be generous, it's bifurcated, uh, the, the, what, what you have and what the state has, and um, I think it would probably be a much better, I, I hope you're successful quickly, and um, I think it would be much better that we could see an overall pattern, and uh, obviously, I think it would be most importantly better for the children, so thank you, I, thank I you. I entirely agree with you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Granted. Redenchik. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Mark Traeger. Um, I said, sorry, uh, another couple questions around um, the legislation. Um, so case planners, uh, our understanding, are supposed to facilitate the consent process for medical care. And when case planning, when, uh, and when case planning responsibility is shared between multiple agencies, the case planner is responsible for coordinating with ACS's consent policy. What role do case planners play to ensure compliance with fully informed consent? Okay. Um, so uh, that's correct. The case planner is involved in um, facilitating the uh, um, collection of informed consent. Um, and their role is often in that when a child attends an, an appointment with a provider, the case planner is often the one who will um, provide the paperwork to the parent for signature. Um, it's, not, it's not ideal that the case planner should be um, the one sharing medical information or trying to translate medical information since they're not trained to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things that we have focused on in the policy that we've designed regarding informed consent for psychiatric um, medications is improving the process by which that happens. So at, at present, I would say that um, 
it works to an extent, and the case planner is involved, but we would prefer that uh, the case planner takes a, actually a lesser role in the right. process. And so who would then fill that role? We would be, what we are um, proposing with the policy is that the role is provided directly by the, the treatment provider, the, the person who is prescribing whatever treatment, whether that's medication or other treatment, uh, that they would be the ones explaining to the parent uh, why the treatment is being, what, recommend, what the recommended treatment is, why it's mm -hmm. being recommended, what the potential benefits of that treatment are, what the potential risks of that treatment are, mm -hmm. and importantly, what the alternatives to that treatment are. So again, whether that's medication or other treatment. Are, are, is, uh, is ACS working with a very specific set of prescribers uh, uh, to prescribe psychotropic medication for uh, for youth at the Children's Center, or is it, I mean, it... No, so in terms of the, the children at the Children's Center, um, again, because of the, the nature of the Children's Center, the population is constantly in flux. As, I, as we've mentioned earlier, we have um, mental health and medical providers on site, but what we uh, try to do in uh, most circumstances is maintain the child's connection with their outside provider. So that's, you know, whoever is already providing treatment for that child. We facilitate them getting to their appointments. We transport them to their appointments. We, through nursing staff, um, communicate with their providers to make sure that we're clear on what their medication regimens are. If they've missed medication, we call the providers to get instructions for restarting medications. If that's not possible in certain circumstances, that's where we'll step in as providers on site to say, yes, it's safe to give this medication or it's not. How do you, what's the system that, that ACS uses to track all of these prescribers? If you have a, if you have a constant uh, fl um, uh, turnover of, of children in the Children's Center, mm -hmm. um, obviously the, there's uh, thousands of, of uh, children, youth in the foster care system. Um, how are, that, that's got to then be hundreds of, of, uh, of you know, not only medical providers, but psychiatric providers. Um, how, are, how are we tracking all of that? Because I think that to ensure uh, uniformity or you know, best practices across the board, um, or just quality medical care, um, we have to know who the prescribers are so that we're getting, so that there's a, a certain standard uh, that, you know, that we hope to achieve Sure, absolutely, yes, and, and that's, that is one of the challenges that, um, that we face. What we have in place right now is, you know, since uh, myself and my predecessor, Dr. Martin Owen, joined ACS about three years ago, one of our primary goals has been to improve prescribing practices for children in foster care. Fortunately, we have the uh, support of Commissioner Hansel and mm -hmm. um, Dr. Yeah. Mendoza as our Chief Medical Officer, who also um, consider those to be very high priority. So what we have introduced over the past couple of years are guidelines as to how psychiatric medication should be prescribed and monitored to make sure that it's used safely. Uh, so those include guidelines on what, what best practices should be. Uh, and that's been distributed to our uh, network of foster care agencies to be distributed to their providers. Um, again, we, it's, it's not possible for us to directly oversee every single case of care. Yeah. What we can do is um, provide the oversight that we have already and with the in new informed consent policy what we are doing is being much stricter about what our requirements are as far as what medication is appropriate mm -hmm. to be prescribed and how we monitor how it's prescribed. Though with cases where a youth is in, I mean I, I imagine that this does not happen necessarily that frequently or maybe it does, I don't know, you could tell me, but uh, cases where the initial prescription is while the child is, is at the children's center, so therefore not with a foster care agency and not under their parental supervision. Mm -hmm. So there's, they're in that, they're directly under the care of ACS at that point. Does that happen frequently or is that, an, is that not so frequent? Uh, so, well, the, it does happen that children at the children's center receive their first prescriptions when they're there. It's usually from their current provider though. It's, it's not um, the mental, as, as I mentioned earlier, we as the providers in the uh, children's center, we don't take the role of being the primary provider. So we're there to maintain safety, we're there to uh, perform evaluations in terms of uh, crisis and safety, but we don't take on the role of prescribing. It's very, very rare that we would be the ones to prescribe a medication.
Right, but so what, what happens if a youth enters the children's center, is there for 60 days, mm -hmm. does not have a prior diagnosis, mental health diagnosis, during that period of time exhibits um, uh, some behavior that somebody there thinks warrants some intervention, yeah. Then, in yeah, that I'll, case... I'll, I'll, the, I'll talk you through the process. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the mental health team has a set of referral criteria. Um, so that's accessed by nursing staff, childcare staff, the social workers in the building, and the, the placement workers in the building. So really anyone who comes into contact with a child is able to provide a referral um, for a mental health evaluation. So on site we have um, three psychologists and two psychiatrists from uh, the ACS NYU uh, Bellevue mental health team. Um, and they are mostly there part-time, so it's three full-time equivalents that we have in the building. So it's a small team mm -hmm. based on you know, the size of the population that we have. Um, but we have criteria based on whether a child is already supposed to be receiving medication or whether they've had a history of being prescribed medication, mm -hmm. um, if they've just recently come from a psychiatric hospital, if they are experiencing some kind of mental health-related distress, so suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts, anxiety, depression. Um, and then we'll perform an evaluation to, maintain, to make sure that they're safe. If for any reason the child is not considered to be safe at that time, that's for one of those situations where we would perhaps call 911 mm -hmm. or, or ensure that the child is taken safely to the hospital, so Bellevue Hospital's next door. Um, so that's often where they'll be transported. In other cases, if we have determined that there is a level of need but it's not that acute that they need to be in the hospital right away, we will refer out through their um, foster care agency if they have one assigned or through uh, their case planner within ACS to ensure that they are set up with a uh, provider. So if they don't have a foster care agency, it would be through the case planner, but then when they eventually go into the, f the foster care system, either with a family or in a group setting, their case will then get transferred over to a provider that is affiliated or associated in some way with the foster care agency, or will the case stay with the doctor that gave their initial prescription? Uh, so it, it, it varies depending on the case and what the needs are. So it's often, for instance, if the child is placed in a residential setting, then the care is completely taken over by the providers who are present in that residential setting. Mm -hmm. um, in other circumstances, they may stay with the the provider that they've been set up with before being assigned to the agency. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, that's it for me because I think we do have to vacate the premises by 1 p.m. So I want to keep things. Um, and uh, Traeger left, so I don't think he's going to be asking any questions. Barry, do you have any other questions? Okay. Thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate the thorough uh, testimony and answering of our questions. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on this issue. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Just one panel. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Kate Wood, the Legal Aid Society. Betsy Kramer, Lawyers for Children. Uh, Lisa Gittleson from Kafka. Theodora Diggs, Sheltering Arms. And Michelle Yanch from Good Shepherd Services. And Stephanie Gandell from, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> Force of habit. Force of habit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, whoever wants to begin. And just make sure you to turn on the microphone. The, the red light needs to be on. Got it, is that? Okay. Yep. Thank you, Chair Levin, and to the committee. 
for holding this hearing and providing us with this opportunity to testify. I am Betsy Kramer, the Pu Director of the Public Policy and Special Litigation Project at Lawyers <laughs> for Children. Mindful of your time, my testimony today is an abbreviated uh, version of the written testimony that I have submitted, and I urge you to read that testimony for a fuller explanation of some of the points that I would like to make today. Since 1984, Lawyers for Children has provided free legal and social work services to children in voluntary foster care, abuse, neglect, and other proceedings in family court. Based on our experience in those individual cases, we also advocate for system-wide reform to improve the lives of children in foster care. We're pleased that the council has chosen to focus on issues at the Children's Center and hope that this hearing will lead to greater accountability for the care and treatment of children who are placed there. The plight of our client, Kenneth, highlights many of the most serious problems that have arisen at the Children's Center. Kenneth is not the first client to be stuck at the Children's Center uh, without appropriate services, and unless things change, he won't be the last. When the Children's Center opened in 2001, Commissioner Scapetta vowed that it would not become a shelter or orphanage. He told the New York Times that it would be a very rare case in which a child stayed for more than 24 hours. Today, it's not so rare. According to the commissioner's testimony, only half of the children who come through the Children's Center leave within 24 hours. Approximately 80 children sleep at the Children's Center each night. Many of those children stay for weeks on end, and some, like Kenneth, stay for months on end. While the Children's Center functions as both a shelter for children who stay for just a few days and as an orphanage for children like Kenneth, despite Commissioner Scavetta's promise, it does not clear whether the Children's Center is required to comply with the regulations governing placements in shelters or placements in residential care settings. Um, and it's not clear what oversight o OCFS provides over the Children's Center. Furthermore, other foster care placements are accountable to the family court when our staff reports on the conditions we see during visits to our clients' homes in foster homes, group homes, or residential treatment centers. At the Children's Center, however, attorneys and social workers are routinely denied access to our clients' living spaces. So we're unable to report to the court on whether they have adequate sleeping places, whether they have adequate clothing, and what their general living conditions look like. Operating without accountability, the Children's Center has failed to meet the needs of too many children placed there. Commissioner Hansel and Deputy Commissioner Farber explain that some children remain at the Children's Center for extended periods of time because there's a shortage of foster care placements for older children, children with developmental disabilities, and children with serious mental health challenges. ACS asserts that many of these children's needs should be better met in placements operated by the State Office of Mental Health or the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities rather than ACS. This is not a new argument. More than 15 years ago, ACS filed a lawsuit seeking to force OPWDD to provide care and services to developmentally disabled children who had been placed with ACS. Since then, ACS has been litigating that case to no avail, while our developmentally disabled clients have been sitting in the Children's Center waiting for placement for far too long. It is now time for ACS to stop denying responsibility for these children and start providing them with appropriate placements and services. Children who spend extended periods of time at the Children's Center are not only deprived of a home. Until recently, they have not been assigned a case planner, the worker assigned to all other children in foster care whose job is to ensure that the child's educational, medical, mental health, and physical needs are met, and who is charged with making reasonable efforts to work with the child's family or other resources to effectuate the child's discharge from foster care. At many foster care agencies, the case planner coordinates the work of education specialists, behavior specialists, recreation specialists, vocational specialists, and family finding staff to work with children placed in their care. Children and youth at the Children's Center do not have the benefit of that assistance. Without a case planner to coordinate all service needs and planning, children like Kenneth are not getting the services or attention they desperately need. It is imperative that every child at the Children's Center be assigned a case planner who is trained to identify service needs, arrange for appropriate evaluations, 
ensure that the child and the child's family are connected to therapeutic interventions and work with the family toward an appropriate permanency goal. It is essential that the Children's Center be staffed by credentialed social workers and child care staff who have received trauma-informed training and that children who are placed there have regular access to mental health services. We are particularly concerned that in order to address some of the problematic behaviors of children at the Children's Center, Commissioner Hansel has chosen to increase the presence of ACS peace officers and to provide additional security and to work with the NYPD rather than increasing the use of social workers and therapeutic staff. There's a large body of research showing that when law enforcement is brought into a non-life-threatening situation with a foster child, the crisis is likely to escalate rather than stabilize, which can have a lasting impact on the child, from increasing the trauma to increasing the odds of involvement in criminal justice in the future. ACS must be prevented from invo invoking security personnel and law enforcement to address issues at the Children's Center unless absolutely necessary. For all these reasons, we urge the City Council to exercise its oversight authority over ACS to impose measures of accountability aimed at both reducing the lengths of stay at the Children's Center and also improving services for children who are there. To that end, we would suggest that the City Council require ACS to provide data reports as set forth in our written testimony and also to provide the Council with the following plans and protocols a plan for developing additional foster care capacity for developmentally disabled children, children with complex mental health needs, and older youth, a plan describing the therapeutic services to be provided for children who spend more than 24 hours at the Children's Center, a protocol for involving law enforcement or security personnel only when absolutely necessary, and a protocol for permitting children's attorneys and social workers to visit their clients living at the Children's Center. We further urge the City Council to provide ACS with additional funding to ensure that ACS properly cares for all children there by employing sufficient full-time staff with the training and expertise appropriate for caring for children who have experienced trauma, who are developmentally disabled, and who have complex mental health needs. This would include case planners, certified social workers, behavior modification specialists, and education specialists to work directly with as many children as possible. Before I conclude, I want to thank the City Council for considering Bill Number 1358, which is also on today's agenda. The overprescription of psychotropic medication for children in foster care has been widely documented. The reporting called for in this bill will provide important perspective on that issue and help to identify trends so that we can begin to address the issue as a systemic problem rather than on a case-by-case -case basis on behalf of one client at a time. In conclusion, I want to thank you for your continued commitment to improving the lives of children in foster care. We're happy to follow up with you uh, on any questions or issues you might have on our testimony and to work with the council to further develop our proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just have one quick question. Yep. Um, what is the reason why that ACS staff would give to not allow a child's lawyer or social worker to visit and see their living quarters? They tell us that um, it would compromise the confidentiality of children living there. But the child has a, the relationship with the social worker and lawyer uh, is a Correct. I think they're referring to other children who are living there, but we routinely visit. And we're not asking for any confidential information regarding those other right. children. Um, and we routinely visit foster homes that have multiple children living in them. Sure residential treatment centers, yeah. group homes, we see other children in foster care all the time. Right. So that's the only excuse they've ever given. Um, okay, I, I, I'm, I should have uh, known about that and asked about that uh, while the commissioner was here, but I will certainly follow up on that and we, should, we should work on that. So I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, moving forward with all of, the, all of the recommendations in your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Levin and Council. I'm Lisa Gittleson. I'm the Associate Executive Director Downstate of the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, Kafka. Our member agencies include over 50 not-for-profit organizations providing foster care, residential care, and the YRCs in New York City. On behalf of our member agencies, their employees, and mostly on behalf of the thousands of children that they serve, we thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Kafka joins in support and an appreciation of the changes made by ACS for the Children's Center. 
The ability to do our work with all that is needed is what makes the difference at this critical moment in the life of a child. In addition to the intensive case reviews for children was, I'm sorry, the addition of intensive case reviews for every child with special needs, security enhancements, expanded high level leadership, additional staff, and the training of staff allows for meaningful and planful work. Similarly, our agencies providing services to youth in the residential care settings face the exact same challenges working with these highest needs youth once they leave the Children's Center and come to our programs. And similarly, the agencies need these exact same enhancements to do the meaningful work with our youth. Our residential care centers, centers and the YRCs are doing the same work or are continuing the work started at the Children's Center. For the continuum to be successful, all of the supports must be equal and must be equally funded. We've had discussion today about the YRCs, and I want to be clear that the intention of setting up the YRCs is similar to the intention of the Children's Center. These are not therapeutic milieus, and they are not able, nor are they set up, to serve those needs of their youth. The goal is that they be able to identify as quickly as possible the appropriate settings for the youth. So I don't want to complicate or confuse what the purposes of the YRCs are. In order for the YRCs or the Children's Center to get the youth into the most appropriate placements as soon as possible, we need real resources for the Children's Center, for the YRCs, and for our residential care providers. It has to be exactly the same things that are being offered at the Children's Center that we offer to the children that are being treated along the whole continuum. Most notably, there needs to be staffing appropriate and necessary to work with these youth. This requires contracts that are budgeted to pay a fair wage in order to hire and retain qualified staff. Our review of the staffing challenges show that for calendar year 18, our nonprofit New York City agencies experienced a 32% turnover rate in direct care work staff. Additionally, the average starting salary for the direct care workers in New York City hovered right at the $15 an hour mark. We cannot properly serve and make change for the high needs youth in our care when we lose one third of our staff every year and are paying the same base rate as McDonald's. In fact, many of our youth who live in our residential centers and are placed at the YRC centers are making more than the staff that care for them. As we approach a new RFP for providing foster care for youth in New York City, we're at a moment in time to take action and provide all that we should for these youth. Our agencies have decades of experience working with very challenging youth and would very much welcome an opportunity to share suggestions as well as brainstorm new ideas to meet the needs of today's youth. These efforts would be in residential care, family foster care, and perhaps even in new preventive service models. These efforts would also include structuring funding for the Children's Center to support the Children's Center as it's functioning now, not as it was originally envisioned. There must be funding to support the census at the Children's Center with youth whose needs are substantial. This exact same structured funding must be extended to the foster care providers. We see all of this work in partnership with ACS with a goal shared to provide the most meaningful services to the most traumatized youth. We do believe that in partnership, there exists meaningful opportunity to bring change. We're certain that we need this partnership to be funded immediately in order to protect and serve these youth. And with regard to the psychi psychiatric medication data collection, Kafka does support the position of ACS with regard to this proposed bill and does not take a separate position. We would note that we take seriously the psychiatric and psychological needs of the youth in our care and the need for medication at times to address these needs. With regard to the collection of data, we also believe that it needs to be contextualized for a full understanding of the reasons for the use of medication. A straightforward collection only will not paint a picture of the youth, their needs, and the situations requiring the medication. I would be happy to answer any questions, and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your testimony. So I, I look forward to working with Kafka on the legislation. We can sit down and talk about that, and, and then for the, the, the broader issues. Um, clearly, the, the budgetary issue is, um, is front and center. Um, that's, it's, a, it's not a, a workable model to have a turnover rate that high and a, and a, and a base pay that is uh, minimum wage. It's not, not right, and it's not going to be effective. So I uh, look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. We Thanks. do as well. Thanks. 
Good afternoon. My name is Theodora Diggs, and I am the program director of the Sheltering Arms Reception Center Annex of the Nicholas Capetta Children's Center. Thank you to the chair, uh, Mr. Levin, and members of the New York City Council Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to testify before you today. Sheltering Arms is one of the city's largest providers of education, youth development, and community and family well-being programs in Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. In addition to serving nearly 500 youth in foster care, more than 2,000 children in preventive services over the course of a year, we have operated the Sheltering Arms Reception Center, sometimes called the Children's Center Annex, since September of 2017. Our reception center, located in the North Bronx, is one of four reception centers citywide that serve children and youth awaiting an appropriate foster care placement. The Sheltering Arms Reception Center is unique in serving, a young, uh, in serving young children ages zero through 12 years old, while the youth reception centers uh, serve as adolescents. I am testifying before you today to ensure that the needs of the children and youth in the, reception, in the reception center are highlighted and that the systemic lack of appropriate support and therapeutic foster care placements for these children and teens with serious behavioral and mental health challenges are addressed. When Sheltering Arms launched our reception center a year and a half ago, Neither we nor ACS anticipated the severity of mental health challenges and behavioral issues we would encounter serving this very young population. We have seen children as young as four, five, and six years old with serious diagnoses such as oppositional defiance disorder, mood disorders, and psychotic disorders. We have received children, children from psychiatric hospitals and have had and have had to refer several children to psychiatric hospitalizations because they have become, they've become a risk to themselves and or other children and staff in the facility. An example is Sarah, uh, whose name has been changed for privacy, is a 10-year-old girl diagnosed with ODD, ADHD, PTSD, and reactive, re, uh, reactive attachment disorder. She was transferred to our reception center from Kings County Children's Psychiatric Hospital. Sarah remained in our program for four months, during which she was hospitalized two times. She was placed in a therapeutic foster home, but has continued to require hospitalization. Another example is James, who was, six years old, who was a six-year-old boy and who was placed with us for only two days before having to be hospitalized for one week before being transferred to Bronx Children's Psychiatric State Hospital. James remained there for a month, was discharged back to our reception center where he stayed with us for five days before he was readmitted to the Bronx Children's Psychiatric. And he stayed there for another month before being released to his biological mother. Children like Sarah and James who struggle with severe mental health issues and require intensive support are not unusual at our reception center. Dozens of children we serve each year come to us with severe mental health and behavioral challenges. It is clear that when these needs are not appropriately addressed in the young population we serve, the symptoms and trauma they experience compounds as they wind through the foster care system. One child in our reception center diagnosed with a mood disorder had been in nine different placements before coming to our reception center at eight years old because even therapeutic foster parents were not equipped to address his intensive needs. While our average length of stay at the reception center is three days, children in need of therapeutic placement end up staying with us for three to four months due to the lack of available and appropriate therapeutic foster care placements. Sometimes therapeutic foster homes, while a great resource for some children, are not even sufficient to meet the needs of children we serve. The training that is currently required to be certified as a therapeutic foster home, while useful, does not address the specific and intensive needs of each child or the severity of the needs of the children that we have observed. 
as an increasing number of children enter foster care with serious behavioral and mental health issues, New York City must ensure that providers and foster parents have the resources to appropriately and meaningfully meet the needs of these children. We urge the General Welfare Committee to continue to push ACS to expand services to children who need intensive therapeutic support, as well as the foster parents who care for them. Um, we are recommending salaries as an additional support have been added to the Children's Center, the Re Reception Center, and voluntary foster care agencies need similar supports. Most notably, we must be able to recruit and retain the appropriate qualified staff necessary to work with these young people. This requires contracts with budgets that allow for salaries at the level needed to attract and retain qualified staff. New, uh, another recommendation is new models of therapeutic care. It's clear New York City needs to explore new models of therapeutic foster care to meet the needs of the children that are currently entering care. <clears throat> staff at the reception center, excuse me, staff at the ex, uh, reception centers and the therapeutic foster homes available for placement need training that specifically addresses the individual needs of children being placed in care. Providers in states across the country are considering the professional foster parent model for therapeutic foster care, which creates opportunity for foster parents to be more th uh, thoroughly trained and appropriately supported to meet the needs of children. Training and support for staff in foster care. Even before a new model is put in place, resources are needed to provide staff at the reception centers with comprehensive trauma training now, uh, now so that they can better support the children and youth with severe behavioral and mental health issues that are coming into care. Both reception center caseworkers and foster parents accepting these high needs children into their homes should receive regular trauma-informed tra training. Evidence-based models like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy among others would be a good place to, uh, to begin to offer more support to foster parents. We also recommend that caseworkers and foster parents be trained together when possible so that caseworkers can support foster parents and also ensure foster parents are able to effectively execute the parenting techniques. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify about these important gaps in support for both children and staff and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. I look forward to um, working with you, particularly around um, supporting uh, the therapeutic foster care system and, and, and foster parents and looking into the model of professional foster parents that you referenced and trying to make sure that we are uh, building up the system and reinforcing the system. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Grudenchik. Just a quick question, and it could be for anybody in the panel. The education of these young people, I, I have um, District 75 school at, at the Creedmoor a Psychiatric Center, the Children's Center, which is attached basically at the hip um, to where the children spend their time. Uh, these children in these placements, are they getting, are they getting um, public school education? What, what kind of resources are you getting from the DOE? They do get public school education. One of the challenges that we face that we are working on though is always getting the necessary transportation to get all of the youth to the appropriate schools. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Okay. Whoever wants to go next. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Yanchi with Good Shepherd Services. Um, thank you for holding the hearing on this important matter. Um, Good Shepherd has operated residential group programs since the 1930s, and currently we have three programs. Um, so with a total bed, total beds of a 56. All of our residents come to us from the Children's Center, and are all of our, the young people we serve are young women. Uh, we support and are very grateful for the steps taken by ACS at the Children's Center to ensure that, that their stay there is as brief as possible, and that while they're there, they receive the care that they need. But as you've heard, the youth that come to us and come to the Children's Center uh, have highly complex trauma histories. Um, we at Good Shepherd are also seeing high rates of young women who have been commercially sexually exploited. Uh, this plays out in many uh, complex ways, behavioral, mental health, and substance abuse disorders, um, 
and, uh, and challenges that really require very highly trained staff um, and high levels of service. The struggle to serve these young people well does not stop at the doors of the Children's Center. It extends into our programs. We are experiencing the same challenges with the same youth and our capacity has been equally strained. We need to address uh, the, the needs of the whole system if we're really going to make a dent here. Um, and that includes on our end, the same ability to, uh, uh, to hire and to retain uh, qualified staff to work with these young with these young people um, and an investment in our programs to bolster what we can provide, make sure that we have better staffing ratios, deeper programming, and that we can really be responsive to the needs of the young people. Um, we need the city to respond uh, to the crisis at the Children's Center with a systemic solution that addresses the entire system of residential care with a systemic investment. Uh, I want to, on that point, want to say that uh, echo my colleagues' comments about the YRCs. You know, we, we operate one of the YRCs, um, and, and they're an important part of the system. But like the Children's Center, they're designed to be short-term placements. What we really need if we're going to um, really move the needle on ensuring that the stay in young people that young people have in these short-term placements, whether it's a YRC or the Children's Center, is that there are really good options for them to move into on the other end of the system. And that's really, I think, where our attention together needs to focus. Uh, we're ready, Good Shepherd's ready to work with the city and the state to explore new models, new interventions, advocate for the investments that we need to comprehensively strengthen the whole system of residential care. Uh, we are in support of ACS and its efforts to bolster the Children's Center, and we providers need to follow suit with some of the measures that they're taking there. Um, we providers have not raised our voices loudly enough about these needs, um, and I, uh, that's really why I'm here today. Um, and I want to ask for your help to make sure that we can get the city focused on addressing the needs of the whole residential system. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Wood. Um, if you could uh, move the microphone a little bit sure. closer, that'd be great. Thank All you. right. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Wood and I am an attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. Thank you, Chair Levin um, and the committee for this opportunity to share our perspective on the conditions at the Children's Center and to express support for Bill 1358. Uh, the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice provides legal representation to children who appear before the New York City Family Courts in all five boroughs in abuse, neglect, juvenile delinquency, and other proceedings affecting children's rights and welfare. In addition to representing many thousands of children each year in trial and appellate courts, the Legal Aid Society pursues impact litigation and other law reform initiatives on behalf of our clients. The Children's Center is intended as a temporary residence for children coming into foster care until a permanent placement is found. I'd just like to reiterate that most of the children entering the doors of the Children's Center have just been removed from their parents or family. Put simply, it can be terrifying for a child to be torn from all that they've known and thrust into an unfamiliar situation. Because of this vulnerability, it's imperative that the Children's Center be safe, supportive, and temporary. We urge you, um, Chair Levin, and the committee to read our full testimony, our full written testimony, but um, for the sake of brevity, I will just focus on a few points today. Um, as we've heard, and according to ACS's own data, the, the Children's Center has had 70 or more children um, for, since at least 2016. As recently as this February, the average number of children reached a high of 87. This surge reflects the fact that many children are experiencing a corresponding dramatic increase in their length of stay. We have several clients at the Children's Center that have been there for at least 30 days and some over a year waiting for a placement. While some of these youth do have higher needs, many are simply waiting for an available foster home. For example, one of our 14-year-old clients remained at the Children's Center for 16 months waiting for a foster home. We see an inadequate array of placements for older youth in general and believe that residential care is not an ideal and often not an appropriate outcome for these youth. It should be served in the community. More must be done to address the significant delays in foster care placement for all children at the Children's Center. There must be major improvements in the placement process and in the placement array 
so children do not languish at the facility for weeks and months. Our second concern involves the over-reliance on law enforcement at the Children's Center and NYPD access to young people at the facility. We have received anonymous reports from ACS staff that express outrage at what is viewed as a culture shift at the Children's Center from, quote, protecting to celebrating when ch a child is arrested. We have been told that 60 youth have already been arrested from the Children's Center this year, and ACS security officers are being trained in arrest procedures and identifying and gathering gang intelligence. An increased police presence has also been reported. Beyond arrest, we're also concerned that the Children's Center unduly allows police access to children while they're at the facility. We understand that ACS does not have a policy prohibiting law enforcement from warrantless entry into the building or from questioning youth without ACS first contacting the youth's attorney. We urge ACS to implement a policy as soon as possible. ACS should require a warrant before allowing police to enter the building in search of a young person, since the Children's Center is considered the youth's residence. Second, ACS should not permit police to question youth unless and until the youth's attorney has been, has been notified. We understand um, that there are more opportunities for training um, for staff at the Children's Center. I think ACS um, pointed that out today in their testimony. Um, but we believe without more training requirements for staff that those, it may have little practical effect. And we continue to hear from our clients about dangerous restraint practices and excessive force used by staff at the Children's Center. Finally, when youth enter foster care and are separated from their families, school obviously can be a great source of stability. Under federal law, youth in foster care are entitled to remain in their school of origin if it's in their best interest to do so. We hear concerns, however, that there are delays in setting up transportation, as my colleague pointed out, and that children are sometimes dropped off late in the morning. We've also heard that young people are pro prohibited at times by ACS from attending school, in particular if the child has a history of truancy, um, but that there are no alternative education services provided for that youth. Separately, we'd like to express our support today for Bill 1358, a bill which would require ACS to collect and report data about the prescription of psychotropic medication for children in its legal custody. We believe this bill fills a critical gap in systemic oversight over the prescription of these medications to this vulnerable population and more closely aligns New York City child welfare monitoring practice with national standards and with federal law. Studies consistently reveal higher rates of psychotropic medication use for children in foster care than in the general population. And it's for these reasons that the federal government New York, OCFS, and several professional organizations have issued guidance to child welfare agencies on implementing effective oversight on both the client and the agency level. And to ensure com compliance with federal law and best practice, ACS must make it a priority to implement the systemic oversight. We, they, can't, they cannot continue to kick the can down the road and wait for other agencies, other state agencies, to provide data about children that are in their own custody. We believe that the bill will fill this gap by allowing ACS and City Council to observe prescribing trends for each foster care agency, track problematic prescribing practices on a systemic level, and provide feedback to and require corrective action from agencies that demonstrate high rates of these dangerous practices. We urge the committee to push this important piece of legislation forward. Thank you for the opportunity to address these important issues. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> quick one, one quick. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> two quick questions, sorry. First, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you are seeing the uh, just as the problem being just as much uh, the placement process as much as the the lack of uh, appropriate uh, placement opportunities. It, ACS never brought up that there was they thought there was any issue about um, the process. I was just curious about. Yeah, I think there are several issues with the placement <clears throat> process, and ACS did touch on some of the things that they're doing to try to remedy that process by creating 
the kin specialist position to identify, mm. you know, relative resources for certain youth, um, and also working with um, DOHMH to try to identify appropriate resources for higher needs youth. But there oftentimes, we, we have heard that there is a lack of a formal process to match children appropriately with a regular foster home. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, that aggravates the issue and the delays. And then, do you uh, agree with um, uh, with Ms. Kramer about um, being denied the opportunity to see the residential settings of, of clients of, of legal aid? The children? You are yes. you are getting denied that. Yes. Okay. Yes. We That's something that, that. Okay. That's something that needs to be remedied immediately with I think some kind of directive from the commissioner. Um, Okay, thank you to this entire panel. Um, this is a, a, yet another example of a time where I wish that the panel, the, this panel went first before uh, ACS so that, uh, so that we got this perspective first. Um, this was all very illuminating and, um, and we are gonna take all of the recommendations. Maybe perhaps we can uh, convene a meeting uh, in the next, you know, in a couple of weeks to, to talk about st uh, steps moving forward. Um, and things that we can uh, go to, to ACS with and, and things that maybe potentially we could legislate or add to the legislation. But uh, I want to thank you so much for your patience and for your testimony and for all the good work that your organizations do. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, does anyone else wish to testify? Oh, okay. At 1.13 p.m. this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>